Chapter 15 of The Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Difficulties in Enslaving the Exiles Continued. Collins, the agent of Watson, left the city of Washington on the 10th of May with full powers to act for the Creek chiefs as well as for his principal, fully provided also with orders from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs directing all officers of the United States, in whose custody the exiles might be, to deliver them to this agent of the slave-dealer. Expecting to find his victims at Fort Pike, he repaired to that place, but on his arrival found they had left for New Orleans some days previously. He forthwith followed them, and reached that city on the 22nd of June, being one day after Reynolds and his prisoners had left that city for Fort Gibson. Thus it will be seen that the efforts of General Gaines and the active vigilance of Major Clark and Lieutenant Reynolds had barely succeeded in getting these people under way for their western homes when the authority for their re-enslavement arrived. Vexed and mortified at this disappointment, Collins took passage on the first packet bound up the river, determined to secure the victims of Watson's cupidity wherever he should find them. While Collins was thus speeding his way up the river, Reynolds and his charge, unconscious that the slave-hunter was on their track, stopped at Vicksburg for a few hours to obtain supplies for their journey. While passing up the river, Reynolds wrote a report to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, stating that on the boat which had left New Orleans on the 19th, 674 prisoners had been placed for emigration, that on the boat which left on the 21st, on which he had taken passage, there were 453, making in all 1,221 Indians and Negroes who were now emigrating to the western country. While they were lying at Vicksburg, Collins arrived, and, as he states, succeeded in getting the order of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs handed to Reynolds. This was undoubtedly correct, for Reynolds wrote the department the same day, saying, "'Since my letter this morning, Enclosing an abstract of my muster roll, Mr. Collins, the attorney, recognized by you, has sent off various papers in relation to certain claims for Negroes taken by the Creek Volunteers, and your order has been received. I have therefore made arrangements with Mr. Collins to accompany me to Little Rock on board of my boat, that no time may be lost in the emigration on the passage from here thither." due care will be had in selecting such only as come within your order, as also to apprise the chiefs and other Indians with regard to the claim. The excitement evinced at New Orleans on the part of the Indians convinced me of the necessity of this measure. I think that between this and Little Rock I will be enabled to persuade them to consent without any resistance on their part. As stated in this letter, Mr. Collins took passage at Vicksburg with Lieutenant Reynolds, and agreed to go on with him and his prisoners until they could persuade the Indians to separate from their friends and companions, their wives and children, or until they could obtain a military force sufficient to compel the separation. Mr. Reynolds says that the excitement on the part of the Indians at New Orleans had convinced him of the necessity of this measure, and the only doubt of his perfect sincerity rests on the assertion that he thought he could, while on the voyage, induce the Indians to consent to such a separation. On the 27th they left Vicksburg for Fort Gibson. While on their passage they had full opportunity to deliberate and consult together as to the best method of carrying out the plan of transforming this small portion of mankind into property— but the universal laws of nature and of nature's God appeared to conflict with this slave-dealing theory. While on the passage up the river, Mr. Reynolds assembled the Indian chiefs and warriors, and laid before them the facts concerning the claim of Watson, and, as he says, explained everything calculated to appease them. But the result we give in his own words, expressed in a letter dated at Little Rock, Arkansas, June 2nd, being one week after they left Vicksburg, in which he says, They, the Indians, at once demurred, McCanopy taking the lead, saying it was contrary to the express words of General Jessup, 
and would listen to nothing calculated to dispossess them of their negroes. Finding them thus determined, I prevented any communication with them on the subject until reaching this place, when they were again called together, and I repeated all that had been mentioned to them before. I told them it was needless to object. My orders were positive, and must be obeyed. All was of no use. They became, if anything, more vexed than before, and left me much exasperated. Mr. Collins witnessed my exertions to carry out your instructions. Indeed, sir, I have been excessively perplexed with these Indians and Negroes. I see no method, in the absence of force, by which possession of the Negroes can be had. The authorities here show a decided inclination to protect the Indians, and there is no doubt every attempt will fail on our part. I have in no instance acted with duplicity. The statements made have been as they actually exist. Thirty-one of the number left at New Orleans are on the official list handed me by Mr. Collins. The whole party were detained several days at Little Rock, in consequence of the low stage of the water. While waiting there, Collins appears to have become impatient, and anxious to get possession of the Negroes. Indeed, from the closing remark of Mr. Reynolds's letter, last quoted, we are led to suspect that little sympathy existed between Reynolds and this agent of the slave-dealer, nor is it unlikely that an officer, bred up in the cultivation of a high and chivalrous sense of honor, would feel some repugnance at being constrained to associate with any man employed in the business which brought Collins to the western country. Knowing, however, that the executive of the United States had become, in fact, a party in this disreputable transaction, he endeavored to manifest at least a respect for those officers of government who had become participants in it. On the 3rd of June, Lieutenant Reynolds addressed an official letter to Samuel C. Roan, governor of Arkansas, stating the circumstances in which he was placed. He set forth the claim of the Creeks and their sale to Watson, together with the fact that Collins was then at Little Rock, anxious to obtain possession of the Negroes, that he, Reynolds, could not deliver them to Collins without assistance, and on that account demanded of His Excellency assistance of the civil authority to aid him in carrying out the policy of the federal government. Here again the workings of the human heart and the laws of human nature cast insurmountable obstacles in the way of carrying out the executive designs. True, Arkansas was a slave state, and her governor was a slaveholder, characterized by that bold and generous nature which usually distinguishes the pioneers of the West. But his letter breathes such a spirit of independence, such a bold and unhesitating regard for justice and propriety, that we prefer to let His Excellency speak for himself. The letter is couched in the following language. Executive Office, Little Rock, June 4, 1838. Sir, your note of this day has been duly received, in which you call on me as the executive of the State of Arkansas to furnish you with military force sufficient to coerce obedience to your instructions to surrender a number of Negroes now with the Seminole Indians under your command, and stating that the Indians manifest a hostile determination not to permit the Negroes in question to be surrendered to the agent or attorney of the Creek Indians. I have also examined the copies of the order from the War Department directed to you on this subject, as well as the schedule of the Negroes and the letter of attorney in the possession of Mr. N. F. Collins, the Creek agent or attorney, to receive the Negroes in controversy. After due reflection on the subject, I have determined not to afford you any assistance to carry these instructions into effect and respectfully request of you not to attempt to turn over those Negroes to the claimants within the state of Arkansas, and more especially not in the neighborhood of Little Rock. And I require of you to proceed with your command of Indians and Negroes to their place of destination, with the least practicable delay, that the citizens of Little Rock and its vicinity may be relieved from the annoyance of a hostile band of Indians and savage Negroes, Without prejudging the claim of the Creek Indians to the Negroes, from the nature of things it is wholly impracticable for the claimants to make a proper designation of the Negroes claimed. There are no witnesses here that can identify the Negroes, not even the person setting up the claim. 
and had the government intended to dispose of those negroes to the creek indians it should have been done in florida and not bring the indians and negroes into arkansas the vicinity of their future residence and then irritate the indians to madness and turn them loose on our frontier where we have no adequate protection the massacre of our citizens would be the inevitable consequence i have just visited the chiefs of your command and assured them that their negroes should not be taken from them and they have pledged themselves that their people shall go on to their country peaceably your immediate departure will ensure peace and avert the outrages you had such good cause to expect you will transmit this note to the proper department at washington as a justification of the course you may pursue in accordance with it i am respectfully your obedient servant sam c roan jonathan g reynolds first lieutenant u s m c and dispersing agent indian department this letter of Governor Roan certainly indicated to Mr. Collins a strong repugnance to the policy adopted by the War Department, and must have convinced him that his mission was at least unpopular among men removed from the moral atmosphere in which the executive appeared to live. We are not informed of its effects upon Mr. Reynolds, but that gentleman could not have been very greatly disappointed, as he had clearly predicted the failure of all attempts to separate the Indians and Negroes. A rise in the Arkansas River enabled them to resume their journey. They reached Fort Gibson on the 12th of June, and both Indians and Negroes were turned over to the care of Captain Stevenson, the agent appointed to reside with the Western Seminoles. Here Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Collins expected to make a final effort to separate the Indians and Negroes, in order that the latter might be transported back to that interminable slavery which all knew awaited their return to Georgia. For this purpose, Lieutenant Reynolds addressed Brigadier General Arbuckle, in command at Fort Gibson. But as the correspondence between these officers brought the important mission of Mr. Collins in that western country to a close, we will present these letters to the reader. On the 12th of June, the day of his arrival, Lieutenant Reynolds addressed General Arbuckle the following note. General, I herewith enclose orders received from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs for the surrender of a certain number of Negroes, belonging to the Seminole Indians, to Mr. N. F. Collins, the attorney appointed by the Creek Delegation which recently visited Washington, which appointment has been ratified by the Department, and feeling myself bound to turn over all in my possession in obedience to such orders, and the Seminole chiefs and Indians refusing positively to give them up. I have to request the employment of such a force, General, as you may deem adequate for carrying into effect my instructions. I am, General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Jonathan G. Reynolds, First Lieutenant, USMC, and Dispersing Agent, Indian Department, to General M. Arbuckle, Commanding, etc., Fort Gibson. General Arbuckle was in command of the military forces of the United States in that western country, and of course felt great responsibility in regard to maintaining peaceful relations with the Indians of that region. Having maturely reflected upon the communication of Mr. Reynolds, he returned the following answer. Headquarters, Western Department, 3rd Division, Fort Gibson, June 13, 1838. Sir, I have received your letter of the 12th instant, with the papers accompanying it, in which you request me to furnish such a force as I deem adequate, to enable you to turn over a number of negroes that were captured by the creek warriors in florida to nathaniel f collins their attorney i have given your application much reflection and have determined to decline a compliance therewith for the following reasons first the difficulty and uncertainty of identifying the negroes actually captured by the creek warriors who are now with their former owners, and in company with a large number of other Indian Negroes, and there being no individual of character present, as far as I am informed, who could with certainty designate them. Secondly, the Seminole chiefs positively declare that General Jessup promised that the Negroes taken from them by the Creek warriors should be returned, and there is reason to believe that such a promise was made other than the declaration of the chiefs. In addition to the above, it is proper that I should state that the Seminole chiefs at the council I held with them yesterday 
voluntarily pledged themselves to give up the negroes in question provided the president of the united states should after being informed of the facts in this case so decide yet they state that many of the negroes have died and that several are claimed to have been captured that were brought in by their owners when they surrendered i am sir very respectfully your obedient servant m arbuckle brevet brigadier general commanding to j g reynolds first lieutenant u s m c and dispersing agent indian department collins now gave up all as lost he appears to have realized that almost every officer of the army west of florida had conspired against this policy of enslaving the exiles while he himself seemed to entertain no doubt of the honor and rectitude of his own position and in order to do him justice and render our narrative brief as consistent we here insert so much of his report to the commissioner of indian affairs drawn up after his return to alabama as relates to his mission up to the time of leaving fort gibson on his return it is as follows tuskegee alabama july twenty ninth eighteen thirty eight sir immediately after my arrival about the first of this month i was taken sick with the fever from which i am just recovering which will account for the delay in communicating the result of my mission to procure the seminole negroes that were to have been turned over to me as agent of the creek indians i left washington on the tenth of may and arrived in new orleans on the twenty second the day after lieutenant reynolds had left there with the indians and all the negroes except thirty-two that were detained by civil authority at the instance of love i did not overtake reynolds until he arrived at vicksburg when after some exertion i succeeded in having his order handed to him and he came ashore and suggested the probability of his being able to induce the indians to consent to deliver the negroes willingly between thirty-five and forty of which by a comparison of our lists we found he had in his possession if i would go on board and proceed up the river with him this i acceded to as i was anxious to pursue such a course as would tend ever so remotely to conciliate the indians and harmonize with the views of the officer in charge the experience of a day or two however proved that these calculations were erroneous and i went on to little rock to get a force to coerce their delivery on our arrival there lieutenant r called upon the acting governor of arkansas for assistance but from some cause or other he refused it as will be seen by the correspondence forwarded to you by lieutenant r i then proceeded with the party to fort gibson calculating certainly on being able to obtain the necessary assistance at that place lieutenant r on arriving within three miles of the fort landed one of the boats and proceeded with the other having all the negroes and some indians directly to the fort and made known to general arbuckle the situation of the affair and presented him with all the papers he held a lengthy interview with the seminole chiefs in which the various talks and promises of general jessup were detailed the number and identity of the negroes denied and the validity of the whole transaction questioned etc and hence the conclusion as he had received no order in relation to the negroes that he should not interfere and directed lieutenant r to land them with the indians first however to conclude the farce he exacted from each chief separately the promise that if the president should decide that the negroes should be given up that they would deliver them to him this of course they promised any explanation or remonstrance urged by me was unavailing End of chapter 15. Recording by Maria Casper. Chapter 16 of The Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Further difficulties in the work of enslaving the exiles after the emigrating company of indians and exiles had left new orleans under charge of lieutenant reynolds general gaines assumed upon himself the whole responsibility of defending the thirty-one who remained in that city 
for as yet there had been no trial upon the merits of the case, although it was pretty evident that the judge was strongly impressed in favor of re-enslaving them. The cause was duly brought to a hearing, and, after argument and consideration, the court gave judgment in favor of the claimants. This was no more than had been expected. General Gaines, faithful to his own convictions of justice, took an appeal to a higher tribunal, and this appeal rendered it necessary for the court to fix a time within which the claimants should enter bail for costs and damages, or the negroes would be delivered up to General Gaines by the sheriff. In the meantime, the executive officers at Washington had become informed of the difficulties which had lain across the path of Mr. Collins, and felt it to be desirable that the whole matter should be arranged with as little discussion as possible. General Jessup retired from the command of the army in Florida on the 15th of May, and returned to Washington, leaving General Zachary Taylor as commander-in-chief of our military forces in that territory. He had shown himself prompt in the execution of all orders, cool, deliberate, and firm in battle, faithful to his men, to himself and his country, but, up to this time, he had manifested no particular zeal in the capture of negroes indeed although he had penetrated farther into the indian country than any other officer had fought the bloodiest battles of any commander in florida yet he refused to draw any distinctions among his prisoners with him indians and negroes were equally prisoners of war and entitled to the same treatment nor would he listen to men who professed to own the persons whom he captured, or who had surrendered themselves as prisoners. The administration, having been a party in the sale to Watson, determined to carry out the slave-dealing arrangement with him, at least so far as regarded the thirty-one negroes who yet remained in New Orleans. In order to effect this object, it was deemed necessary to have the cooperation and aid of General Taylor. The adjutant general, therefore, addressed him on the subject, enclosing to him the letter of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, dated the ninth of May, addressed to the Secretary of War, and heretofore referred to. General Taylor evidently thought the honor of the service would be compromised by the slave-dealing transaction. He subsequently became President of the United States, and as the reader will feel anxious to understand precisely the views which he entertained, we give that portion of his letter to the Adjutant General, which relates to this subject. It is in the following words. Quote, I have the honor to acknowledge your communication of the 10th of May, 1838, accompanied by one of the 9th from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, addressed to Captain Cooper, Acting Secretary of War, on the subject of turning over certain Negroes, captured by the Creek warriors in Florida to a Mr. Collins, their agent, in compliance with an engagement of General Jessup. I know nothing of the Negroes in question, nor of the subject, further than what is contained in the communication above referred to. But I must state distinctly for the information of all concerned, that, while I shall hold myself ever ready to do the utmost in my power to get the Indians and their Negroes out of Florida, as well as to remove them to their new homes west of the Mississippi, I cannot for a moment consent to meddle with this transaction, or to be concerned for the benefit of Collins, the Creek Indians, or any one else. End quote. This language was received at the War Department without reproof, although the Secretary was from South Carolina, bred up in the chivalrous doctrines of the Palmetto State. He quietly suffered a Brigadier General thus plainly to express his contempt for this slave-dealing transaction, in which not only the War Department, but the President of the United States, was involved. He appears to have been willing to encounter almost any kind of disrespect, rather than call public attention to the subject. In the meantime, other claims were presented to the Department for those exiles, or portions of those, who had been captured by the Creeks. Gad Humphreys filed with the Secretary of War a list of forty-seven slaves, who had fled from him in 1830, stating that they had gone to the Seminoles, 
and that a part of them had been sent to Fort Pike. Colonel Humphreys appeared to regard himself as entitled to the possession of those people, although by the Treaty of Payne's Landing the Seminoles had paid for all slaves residing within them prior to 1832, and had been released from all further demands on account of such slaves. Colonel Humphrey stated that his claim had been examined by the late agent, General Wiley Thompson, and decided against him, but insisted that the decision was wrong, and avowed his ability to show it erroneous, by proper proof, whenever he should have an opportunity, and again demanded that the slave should be brought back to Florida, where he could present his proof without trouble. This letter was enclosed in one directed to Mr. Downing, delegate in Congress from Florida, and by him transmitted to the Secretary of War, and by that officer referred to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Thus driven to the wall, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs came out in plain and unmistakable language, asserting the doctrine that the government held the power and constitutional right to dispose of prisoners taken in war, whatever their character may be. This doctrine had been eloquently sustained by General Gaines on the trial in New Orleans. It was the doctrine avowed by Hon. John Quincy Adams in the House of Representatives during the next session of Congress, but it called down upon him much abuse in that body and in the Democratic papers of the country. The Commissioner's report to the Secretary of War set forth in distinct language that the claims of individuals to slaves were precluded by the action of the government in sending these people west, that they had been captured by the army and disposed of by the executive, and the actions of the department could not be changed in consequence of individuals claiming them as slaves. In short, he repeated the doctrine advanced by General Gaines at New Orleans. The report also confirmed the policy of General Taylor in disregarding the claims of individuals to persons captured by the army, and was a tacit condemnation of that pursued by General Jessup, and previously sanctioned by the Secretary of War. This report was passed over to the Secretary. That officer, Mr. Poinsett, having received this report, transmitted it to Colonel Humphreys. This drew from that gentleman a still more elaborate argument in favor of his claim, which occupies nearly four heavy pages in documentary form. This was also transmitted to Mr. Downing, and by him passed over to the Secretary of War, but we are not informed whether the Secretary of War replied to this second argument or not. It is, however, important to the truth of history to notice this recognition of the doctrine by a slaveholding Secretary of War, that the executive in time of war may separate slaves from their masters and send them out of the country, without regard to the relation previously subsisting between them and their owners. The principle was thus recognized by Mr. Poinsett, although a citizen of South Carolina, acting under the advice and direction of Mr. Van Buren, a Democratic President of the United States. General Jessup also, in a report to the War Department, declared that, in his opinion, the Treaty of Payne's Landing exonerated the Indians from all claims for slaves which accrued prior to that date, and that Colonel Humphreys and other claimants could only demand a proportion of the $7,000 allowed by the Indians for slaves then residing among them. This suggestion was obviously just, and was approved by the Secretary of War, and we are naturally led to inquire why the same obviously just rule was not applied to some hundreds of other cases precisely like that of Colonel Humphreys. In the meantime, Lieutenant Reynolds having accomplished his mission, so far as the emigration of the captives shipped on board the two boats, which left New Orleans on the 19th and 21st of May, were concerned, returned to that city in order to complete the duties assigned him in regard to the 31 prisoners who had been detained there by legal sequestration. Collins, faithful to the trust reposed in him, also returned to New Orleans with the full purpose of securing those people as slaves to Watson. They reached the city on the 23rd, and found the slaves still in the possession of the sheriff, as the time assigned by the court within which the plaintiff was to enter bail had not expired. On the 25th of June, 
Mr. Collins addressed a note to Mr. Reynolds, inquiring whether there had been any decision of the court upon the claim of love to the Seminole Negroes left at that place, and what number he, Reynolds, was satisfied belonged to the Creek Indians, and demanding that such as belonged to them should be delivered to him under the order of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Mr. Reynolds replied that he understood the case had been dismissed, but as he, Reynolds, was then acting under a superior officer, Major Clark, he would refer Mr. Collins to him. On the following day, Collins addressed Major Clark on the subject, but receiving no answer, and becoming vexed and disgusted with the business, he left the city on the 27th for his home in Alabama. In justice to Mr. Collins, we let him speak for himself, and quote the remainder of his report to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, being that portion which relates to his efforts to get possession of these thirty-one exiles. It reads as follows. Quote, on arriving at New Orleans on my return, I found the representatives of love had withdrawn their claim against those thirty-two negroes that were left there, thirty-one of which Lieutenant R. expressed himself satisfied belonged to the claim. I addressed a note to Lieutenant R., requesting that such of the negroes as he was satisfied of the identity might be turned over to me. He in turn referred me to Major Clark, who was his senior officer and who had received similar instructions to his own. I had, in company with Lieutenant R. the day before, called upon Major Clark, and learned his determination in relation to the Negroes. He did not recognize the validity of his order, inasmuch as, by order of the Secretary of War, did not precede your signature, and had even the hardihood to state that, by an examination of the lists, None of those Negroes in New Orleans were embraced in the claim I presented, and subsequently ordered Lieutenant Reynolds to send the Negroes forthwith to Arkansas. After I saw a settled and determined purpose to thwart me, there as well as elsewhere, I left New Orleans on the next day for this place, and since my arrival here, I have learned by a letter from Lieutenant Reynolds that the Negroes were sent off the next day after I left. Captain Morrison I did not see, not perhaps being as fruitful in expedients as some others of them. He stopped at Fort Jackson, and sent to New Orleans for transportation, outfit, etc., and passed the city on his way up, without but few knowing who he was, or anything else in relation to him. I learned indirectly from Major Clark, who probably did not intend this admission for me, that he had between twenty and thirty of the negroes on board belonging to this claim i am sir with the highest respect yours etc n f collins c a harris esq commander indian affairs washington d c it is most obvious that collins believed that the military officers of government who were serving at a distance from washington viewed his mission with no particular favor and he evidently retired from New Orleans with some degree of indignation. In the meantime, the claimant Love, despairing of obtaining the Negroes, refused to enter bail for costs and damages, in case the suit should be determined against him in the higher court, and the sheriff delivered them over to Mr. Reynolds on the same day that Collins left the city. On the next day, Mr. Reynolds wrote the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, saying, quote, the thirty-one negroes who were arrested, seized from me, and lodged in the jail of the city, were last evening surrendered to me. The Creek Attorney, N. F. Collins, Esquire, nor any authorized agent being present, and not wishing to detain them at the expense of the government, they were immediately embarked and dispatched west, with twenty-five days' provisions, under the charge of Assistant Conductor Benjamin, who, to satisfy the Indians, had been left with the Negroes at the period of the service of the process, of which fact I informed the department at the time. End quote. These thirty-one prisoners who had been thus detained were now once more under way for their western home. Their hearts appeared to beat more freely as the noble steamer, which bore them on their way to their friends and future homes, cut loose from her moorings and sped her way toward her destined port. On board that happy craft, also, 
were many smiles and hearty congratulations exchanged among those children of the forest who had been borne along on the tide of ever varying circumstances although helpless and penniless and apparently friendless they had almost miraculously escaped the meshes which our government and the slave dealers had spread for their destruction in due time they reached fort gibson and were delivered over to the care of the proper agent who conducted them to their friends and now some nine hundred seminoles and some three to four hundred exiles had reached the indian country they constituted the first party of that nation who driven from their homes their native wilds had consented to be taken to a strange land they had been assured by general jessup and all officers who spoke for the government that the treaty of payne's landing was to be complied with to enforce that treaty had been the order of general jackson general cass had declared that the indians must comply with that treaty while to our indian agents he asserted it to be the policy of the government to unite the creeks and seminoles as one people but the indians and exiles were constantly assured that they were to have a tract of country set off to their separate use and when they entered into the articles of capitulation with general jessup on the eighteenth of march eighteen thirty seven that officer on behalf of the united states had stipulated to protect the indians and their allies in the enjoyment of their lives and property but now the turpitude and guilt of the executive were revealed the orders of the agent directed him to take them on to the territory assigned to the creeks this would subject them to creek jurisdiction and creek laws and they were perfectly conscious that every exile would be immediately enslaved yet there is no country which they could call their own the perfidious pretense of enforcing the treaty of payne's landing without giving them a separate territory according to the supplemental treaty now stood exposed in its proper light abraham was a man of influence with his brethren he had used his utmost efforts to induce them to emigrate he had been honest he believed in the integrity of our nation of its people its government but his error had been fatal the exiles were in the western country without a home and with no means of support except the stipulation of government to furnish them provisions for one year it was at this time when a christian government had violated its faith most solemnly pledged in order to enslave a people who for ages had been free that a pagan government performed towards the exiles and seminoles the christian duty the hospitality of furnishing them temporary homes the cherokees had volunteered to exert their influence with the indians and exiles in favor of peace they had induced many of them to come into the american camp under flags of truce which had been violated and their persons seized held prisoners and sent west they had themselves apparently been involved in this treachery practiced by our government and under these circumstances they consented to share their own possessions with the seminoles and exiles until further arrangements were made they consented to have the seminoles and exiles settle on their land for the present until the government could be induced to fulfill its most sacred compacts with these victims of slaveholding persecutions end of chapter sixteen recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter seventeen of the exiles of florida by joshua giddings this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano total failure of all efforts to enslave the exiles the indians and exiles who had emigrated now found themselves separated at the distance of more than a thousand miles from their brethren in florida with whom they could hold no intercourse they were without a country without permanent homes residing upon the lands of the cherokees at the mere sufferance of that tribe whose humanity had been awakened and whose sympathy had been extended to them their situation and discontent were duly communicated to the executive but it appears to have been regarded as of too little importance to receive attention but while the president and the war department disregarded all complaints coming from the seminoles and exiles they relaxed no effort to secure watson 
in the possession of the ninety human beings whom he had purchased of the Creek Indians, at the request of the executive. As the last resort, instructions were sent to General Arbuckle, commanding in the West, to make investigations, and ascertain what more could be done for the re-enslavement of those people. That officer replied to this communication as follows, quote, Headquarters, 2nd Department, Western Division, Fort Gibson, August 27, 1838. Sir, I had the honor, on the 22nd instant, to receive your instructions of the 21st Ultimo, together with the papers to which they refer. I extremely regret that the United States is liable to suffer loss in consequence of the Creek warriors, having sold and received pay for the Negroes they captured from the Seminole Indians in Florida. And these Negroes having been imprudently returned to the possession of their former owners at New Orleans, and brought to this place, with two hundred or more other Negroes belonging to the Seminoles. Owing to these transactions, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to identify at most but few of them, and from the present position of this case, it is not probable that one of the Negroes will be obtained except by force. For further information in relation to this subject, I beg leave to refer you to my letter to Captain Armstrong, Acting Superintendent of the Western Territory, of this date, a copy of which is herewith enclosed. I shall do all in my power to prevent loss to the government, and will, at an early period, have the honor to advise you of the measures taken in the case. I have the honor to be, sir, with great respect, your obedient servant, M. Arbuckle, Brevet Brigadier General, USA, Honorable J. R. Poinsett, Secretary of War. End quote. The letter to Captain Armstrong, Superintendent of the Western Territory, was as follows quote, Headquarters, Second Department, Western Division. Fort Gibson, August 27, 1838. Sir, I received by the last mail from the Honorable the Secretary of War a communication under date of the 21st Ultimo on the subject of the Negroes captured by the Creek Warriors, together with a letter from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs to the Secretary of War under date of the 19th Ultimo relating to the subject, copies of which are herewith enclosed. All other papers or transactions in relation to this matter, it is presumed, you are apprised of. It will be seen by the communication first referred to, that it was not known at Washington, at the date of that letter, that the Creek warriors had been paid for the Negroes. That circumstance, however, just to the warriors and proper, so far as you have had an agency in the affair, will increase the difficulty of obtaining the Negroes as it is believed the Creek warriors will not now give themselves any trouble to have the Negroes delivered to the individuals to whom they sold them, and notwithstanding the pledge of the Seminole chiefs to me, to surrender the Negroes in the event the government should so require, after reconsidering their claim to them, I do not believe they will comply with their promise, with the knowledge that the Negroes are to be taken from this country as the servants of a white man. Finally, as the Seminoles are greatly under the influence of their Negroes, there is scarcely a hope that the captured Negroes will be surrendered without the application of force, which is not required, and, in that event, it is not probable they could be had, as they would no doubt run away the moment they are informed a military force is to be employed to take them, and in such case it is believed they would be assisted, when necessary, by most of the Seminoles and by all the Seminole and Creek Negroes, and if the captured Negroes could be placed in the possession of the Creek agent, he would not detain them a moment without he had a suitable guard for that purpose. I am therefore of the opinion that the best means that can now be resorted to to prevent loss to the United States is, if possible, to induce the Seminoles to refund from their annuity the sum paid to the Creek warriors for the Negroes, in the interest on the same until paid. I will be much gratified if you can visit this post in six or eight days, when the Seminole chiefs can be assembled here, with the object of inducing them to agree to the measure proposed, or such other as may be deemed advisable, 
in the event that it may not be convenient for you to be at this post at an early period i request that you will favor me with your views on the subject of this communication by the return of mail i am sir with much respect your obedient servant m r buckle Rivet, brigadier general u s a captain w armstrong acting superintendent western territory choctaw agency end quote. This correspondence might well have concluded the efforts of the executive to deliver these ninety exiles to the slave dealer. It were unnecessary to say that General Arbuckle's labors in this behalf proved useless. He had foretold such failure in his letter to the War Department. In January 1837, the Creek warriors captured these people, and for almost two years the influence of the executive had been exerted to enslave them. But a series of incidents, unequaled in real life, had constantly succeeded each other, preventing the consummation of this intended crime, yet the slave power was inexorable in its demands. These circumstances failed to convince the President that it was useless for the executive of a great nation to contend against the plainest dictates of justice, against those convictions of right which dwell in the breast of every human being who has not extinguished the moral feelings of his nature. Collins, having returned to his plantation in Alabama, deliberately drew up and transmitted his report to the commissioner of indian affairs which we have heretofore quoted but when he was subsequently informed that the thirty-two exiles who were in the hands of the sheriff at new orleans had on the day of his leaving that city been delivered over to reynolds and sent west his indignation was further excited and he immediately wrote the commissioner of indian affairs again more distinctly charging the officers engaged in the emigration of these people with bad faith he wrote as follows, quote, Montgomery, Alabama, August 8, 1838. Sir, since writing you a week since, I have understood that Lieutenant Reynolds has informed you that on his arrival in New Orleans, the Negroes that were detained there had been surrendered to him, and that, in consequence of my not being there, they were sent off to, etc. After seeing so much duplicity and management, as has been manifested by the officers with whom I have recently had intercourse, particularly Lieutenant R. I am not surprised at the above statement. Lieutenant R. is well apprised that the Negroes had been turned over to him while I was in New Orleans, and it is also susceptible of proof. During my stay their arrangements were privately making to charter a boat to transport them. After I learned this, I purposely threw myself in his way but he said not a word to me in relation to the negroes until i addressed him the note which is herewith enclosed after receiving his answer i in his presence addressed the enclosed copy to major clark but before i had procured a messenger to carry it to major c lieutenant r after being a short time absent from the room returned and informed me he had seen the sheriff and he had refused to turn over the negroes to him which rendered it as i conceived unnecessary to send a note to major c after my return home he wrote that the next day after i left it seems the sheriff reviewed his decision and a second time turned them over to lieutenant r and as he states in his letter to me the major clark ordered them to proceed forthwith to arkansas why it was necessary then for me to have been there since he had yielded everything to his senior officer and that officer he knew had determined not to respect the order he had received, and had determined, as his previous statement and subsequent conduct prove, to send them forthwith to Arkansas. It is about such a subterfuge as the sheriff turning the negroes, and withholding them after my letter to Major C. was seen, and then turning them over again after it was known I had left. It is due Lieutenant R. to observe that he stated to me the sheriff had told him a lie, I know not what object he could have had in view in doing so. I remained in New Orleans four days, in which time I became convinced, from the maneuvering that was evinced, that nothing would be gained by a longer stay. And as the sickly season was approaching, I left with the conviction that the sheriff would alter his decision as soon as I left there. I am, with the highest respect, sir, yours, etc., N. F. Collins, Agent, Creek Warriors. C. A. Harris, Esquire, Commissioner, Indian Affairs. End quote. It is worthy of notice that this agent of a slave dealer 
should thus address to one of the executive departments of this august nation complaints against the sworn officers of our government but it is still more worthy of note that the war department should call on its authorized and sworn agents to respond to complaints coming from such a source copies of collins's two letters were immediately enclosed to lieutenant reynolds accompanied by a letter from commissioner harris of which we give a copy Quote, war department office of commissioner of indian affairs august twenty seventh eighteen thirty seven sir i enclose copies of two letters from n f collins esq one of the twenty ninth ultimo and the other of the eighteenth instant in relation to the negroes which you were directed to turn over to him as the agent of the creeks from these papers and from other information received here it would seem there has been great disregard if not a violation of the orders of the war department in this matter i trust you will be able to make such explanations of your conduct as will relieve you from censure a prompt answer is desired it may not be amiss to inform you that when on duty in the indian department you are bound to obey the orders of no military officer unless you have been placed under his direction captain morrison is the only army officer authorized to control your movements very etc c a harris commissioner lieutenant j g reynolds end quote. these intimations to lieutenant reynolds of censure and the distinct call for explanations could be neither misinterpreted nor misunderstood and although the complaints and charges have been preferred not merely by a man in private life but by an individual whose very employment as an assistant slave dealer had rendered him odious and infamous among honorable men yet this officer who had fought under the flag of his country and was ready at any moment to peril his life in support of his country's honor was now constrained to meet charges coming from an infamous source the surprise of lieutenant reynolds at this procedure was expressed in the following letter quote, new orleans september twenty eighteen thirty eight sir your letter dated twenty seventh ultimo enclosing copies of two communications received at your office from mr n f collins the creek attorney came to hand on the tenth instant i was surprised at being called upon to answer for my conduct toward mr collins as also the department for disregarding its orders indeed sir i have been in my own estimation too faithful a servant in the special department in which it was the pleasure of general jessup to assign and you to continue me to make a defense to the allegations advanced by collins at the time of mr collins departure from the city he did not evince that virulence of feeling that he has thought proper to express in his letter on the contrary he was then apparently under the full conviction that i had done all that was possible to aid him and carry out the orders received in relation to the negroes in question what object could i possibly have in wishing clandestinely and in the very face of orders to send those negroes to arkansas had mr collins been here sir so far as i was concerned he should have had the negroes upon identity i enclose paper sir from various gentlemen to disprove the assertion of mr collins that the negroes were in my possession during the time he was here on the contrary they did not come into my hands until some time after his departure it is true i have frequently referred to major clark for advice in matters relative to my official situation it was on account of the high regard i have of his character as a gentleman and an officer of long standing and experience and whose integrity stands preeminently and deservedly high i have the honor to be sir very respectfully your obedient servant j n o g reynolds u s m c distribution agent independent department c a harris commissioner indian affairs washington city d c End quote. we have too little space in this work to copy official papers to any considerable extent those which accompanied lieutenant reynolds reply were first a full statement of facts from sheriff busson showing that the thirty-one prisoners who had been in his charge were not turned over to major clark until the twenty eighth of june eighteen thirty eight second a full statement of facts by george whitman owner of the steamboat who contracted to carry the prisoners west third a similar statement by major clark of the facts that came within his knowledge 
accompanied by a copy of a communication from J. N. O. C. Casey, acting Seminole agent. All these statements showed that Lieutenant Reynolds had strictly obeyed his orders, and whether they proved satisfactory to the War Department or not, we are unable to state. It is, however, believed that no further proceedings were had in relation to the conduct of that officer. Mr. Collins, finding that he possessed some influence with the War Department, on the 18th of October, wrote the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, saying, quote, I have now to request that, should General Arbuckle be unable to comply with the instructions I understand he has received, from which my knowledge of the Indian character I have no doubt he will, this claim may be laid before the agent, who may be appointed to investigate the claims of the Creeks, with the necessary documents, that it may be examined and reported on by him. End quote. In response to this letter, Mr. Crawford, acting Commissioner of Indian Affairs, replied, stating that General Arbuckle had, on the 28th of September, informed the Department that the Negroes could only be obtained by military force. Mr. Crawford also assured Mr. Collins that General Arbuckle had been instructed to act in concert with Captain Armstrong for the purpose of obtaining a treaty with the Indians, by which provisions for this claim would be made, and that the necessary papers had been transmitted to those gentlemen to enable them to act with the correct understanding of the subject. But the Creek Indians appeared to have become impressed with the opinion that the whole proceeding was either unjust or dishonorable, and they wholly refused to participate any further in the transaction. The exiles and Indians were now living on the Cherokee lands. The Creeks would have nothing further to do with Watson, nor with the United States, in regard to the captured Negroes. The Seminole Indians showed no disposition to surrender them to slavery, and the exiles themselves exhibited no intention of going voluntarily into bondage. General Arbuckle advised against the employment of military force to effect that object. And to all present appearances, these ninety exiles had, through a train of mysterious incidents, been preserved from bondage. The Florida War had become unpopular, and Watson, the purchaser of the supposed slaves, had warm personal friends among the Whigs of Georgia. They were quite willing to subject Mr. Van Buren to any degree of odium in their power. Watson, therefore, sent his petition to Congress, asking indemnity for the loss of slaves whom he had purchased of the Creeks at the instance, and by the recommendation of the executive officers of government. In order to sustain the claim of Watson, it was necessary to place the facts attending this transaction before the House of Representatives. For this purpose a resolution was adopted on the 28th of January, 1839, calling on the Secretary of War for, quote, such information as was to be found in his office touching the capture of Negroes and other property from the hostile Indians during the present war in Florida. End quote. In answer to this resolution, the Secretary of War, on the 27th of February, made report, embracing 126 pages of printed matter. It was numbered H. Document 225, and ordered to be printed. From that document, much information has been obtained in regard to the capture and emigration of this first party of Indians and exiles to the western country. The result of the speculation in human flesh is so essential to a correct appreciation of the whole transaction that we deem it proper to give, in this connection, the proceedings of Congress upon that subject, although it may appear to be rather a digression from the chronological narration of events which constitute the subject of our history. It will be recollected that the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, in his letter to the Secretary of War, dated the 1st of May, 1838, suggested it might create agitation were the Department to ask Congress for an appropriation of money to carry these exiles to Africa, or for any other disposition of them, that, to suppress all discussion in Congress upon the subject of slavery, gag resolutions and gag rules have been adopted at each session since 1835. It was under the operation of these rules that the advocates of slavery expected to pass a bill to indemnify Watson for his loss, in failing to enslave these exiles. During the summer of 1839, the document, number 225, above referred to, was printed. According to the practice of that day, few, even of the members of Congress, examined these documents. A copy of this, however, was placed on file, 
with Watson's petition and other papers, as evidence on which his claim rested. At the commencement of the next session, the author of this work, being a member of the House of Representatives, was placed upon the Committee of Claims, at the head of which was Honorable David Russell of Washington County, New York, a man of great industry, integrity, and ability, always independent, according to the general views of that day, and upright in the discharge of official duties. Honorable William C. Dawson of Georgia was also a member of that committee, and appeared to take much interest in this claim. He was a man of much suavity of manner, of which that class of southern statesmen, who felt necessary to carry every measure by the influence of personal kindness, and an expression of horror at all agitation of the slave question, under the apprehension that it might dissolve the Union. Mr. Dawson was anxious to get this claim of Watson through Congress, and not expecting the chairman of the Committee on Claims to favor its passage, requested the author to examine and give support to it. It was that examination which gave him the first information as to the real cause of the Florida War. After a full and thorough investigation, he assured Mr. Dawson that he would be constrained to oppose the passage of any bill giving indemnity to Watson. At that time it was the usual practice for the Committee on Claims to leave all petitions asking pay for slaves, or which involved the question of slavery, without reporting upon them, lest they should cause agitation, there being no prospect of obtaining from the committee a favorable report. The case was at the next session of Congress referred to the Committee on Indian Affairs, who reported in its favor, providing for the payment of the full sum which Watson gave the Creeks, and interest thereon from the time of the contract up to the time of passing the bill. This bill was placed on the calendar, and in 1841 the author endeavored to call attention to it, in a speech made in the House of Representatives on the Florida War. This led some members to examine it, and some of them, more independent than others, declared their hostility to its passage. In the 28th Congress, the author, having become obnoxious to the slaveholders, was removed from the Committee on Claims, and Watson's petition was again referred to that committee in order that it should receive the prestige of its influence. But it was reported upon late, and was so low on the calendar, that it was not reached during that Congress. In the 31st Congress, Mr. Daniels, Chairman of the Committee on Claims, reported it in February, but General Crowell, of Trumbull County, Ohio, being on the committee, opposed its passage, and caused a postponement for that session. And at the next session, it was after a short discussion, passed over without any final action upon it. At the 32nd Congress, the Committee on Claims was yet more favorably constituted for the slave interest. Mr. Sackett, of New York, and Mr. Rantoul, of Massachusetts, being the only two members upon it who openly resisted the slave power. Mr. Egerton, of Ohio, Mr. Seymour, of Connecticut, and Mr. Curtis, of Pennsylvania, being Northern Democrats, remained silent during the discussion of this claim. It was, however, again reported by the chairman, Mr. Daniels, of North Carolina, at an early day, and a full determination to carry it through was manifested by the slaveholders. Both of the great political parties were at that time, 1852, endeavoring to suppress all agitation of the slave question. Southern men, particularly, were horrified at every appearance of discussion in relation to the peculiar institution and they hoped to pass this bill without even an examination of its merits before the House. But the opponents of slavery were not idle. Efforts were privately made to call attention of gentlemen to this claim, that they might examine its merits before it came up for discussion, and in looking into it, a number of members prepared to oppose its passage. After one or two postponements, it came on for discussion on the 25th of February, 1852. Mr. Sackett of New York met the case at once, in a speech which showed that he had studied it very thoroughly, and understood it perfectly. He insisted that slaves were not plunder, and did not come within the contract of General Jessup, which gave to Creeks the plunder they might capture. Second, that the whole transaction was one of speculation on the part of Watson, inasmuch as the report set forth that the Negroes were worth at least $60,000, while he paid only $14,600 being less than one-fourth their value, evidently taking upon himself all risk of title and possession. Third, 
that the officers of government had no authority to involve the nation in this slave-dealing transaction. Fourth, that those officers were not the government, and could not bind the people to pay their funds for human flesh. Mr. Abercrombie of Alabama was in favor of the claim. He declared that he was in Florida at the time of this contract, and knew all about it, and that it was well understood that the term plunder did include slaves. Mr. Daniels, chairman of the committee, felt called on by the effort of Mr. Sackett to speak early in the discussion. He insisted that General Jessup, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs and Secretary of War, fully understood the case, that it was understood by the parties that the term plunder did include slaves, that Watson was drawn into this matter partly to relieve the government from the transaction in which it had become involved. He insisted that the Negroes captured were slaves of the Seminoles, but when inquired of on that point, could only say that officers engaged in the Florida War had spoken of them as such. He was much embarrassed by interrogatories propounded to him by Mr. Stanton of Ohio and other gentlemen. Mr. Mace of Indiana, a Democrat, took a short and comprehensive view of the case. He, nor any other man, could tell whether these Negroes were slaves or free men. On the part of the officers of government, there was not a single impulse of humanity manifested in regard to these people, but all their endeavors were put forth to enslave them. He was entirely opposed to the bill. Hon. John W. Howe of Pennsylvania would never give his vote in favor of regarding men and women and children as plunder. He commented with much force upon the contract and the documentary evidence before the House, and would maintain the humanity of all prisoners captured in war. He sustained the position of General Gaines that they were prisoners of war. On the 10th of March the bill came up again for consideration, when Mr. Johnson, of Georgia, advocated its passage in a very elaborate speech. He differed from Mr. Sackett, Mr. Howe, and those who opposed the bill, mostly upon the great question, insisting that slaves were property under our federal constitution, that the people captured by the Creek Indians were not possessed of any rights, that they were to be regarded as mere chattels. Indeed, this point lay at the foundation of the entire discussion. He, however, sought to add strength to the claim by reading letters from Mr. Crawford, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and from Mr. Poinsett, Secretary of War, to show that they sympathized with the slave dealer, and were desirous that this bill should pass. Mr. Welch of Ohio, in few words, declared his conviction that these Negroes were prisoners of war, to be treated as such, and not to be regarded as slaves or chattels. Mr. Evans of Maryland thought it difficult to understand the case, but would adopt the views of Judge Iverson, of Georgia. The gentleman had been a member of the House of Representatives, and his statements could be relied upon. He read a long affidavit, showing the recollection of Mr. Iverson, and, as the United States had the property in possession, he would vote for the bill. Mr. Stewart of Michigan, now a Democratic senator, thought the government had been in great difficulty in getting the Seminoles to go west. They would not go without the Negroes, many of whom had intermarried with the Seminoles. By the treaty which General Jessup made, in 1837, our government was bound to send the Negroes west, and having done so, was bound to pay Watson for his loss. Mr. Skelton of New Jersey, a Democrat, recognized no power in this or any other government to treat prisoners of war as slaves. The discussion had become interesting, and, in some degree, constituted an agitation of the slave question, and as the committee rose without taking a vote upon the bill, Mr. Orr of South Carolina moved a resolution precluding further debate upon it, but the House adjourned without taking a vote on the resolution. The case came up again on the 10th of April, when a resolution to close debate in one hour was adopted. The House then resolved itself in committee, and Mr. Bartlett of Vermont, a Democrat, took the position that the government, nor its officers, had power to enter into any agreement with Indians or white men, by which they should enjoy any privilege, or receive any compensation, not authorized by law, that the contract between General Jessup and the Creeks was of no validity, but absolutely void, and every transaction touching the enslavement of the exiles was without authority and of no effect. Mr. Walsh of Maryland insisted that the Indian tribes were not nations, 
and ought not to be treated as such, that it was not incumbent on the friends of the bill to show that slavery existed among the Seminoles. If they lived within a slave state, they might hold slaves, that the government had the right to enslave the Negroes when captured. Mr. Sweetser of Ohio, Democrat, denied the authority of General Jessup to make any contract for the services of the Creek warriors other than the law had provided, nor could he have authority to make any stipulation as to the disposal of prisoners when captured. Mr. Sutherland of New York, a Whig, thought the question of slavery was not necessarily involved in this case, that the United States, having sent the Negroes west, were bound to indemnify Watson for his loss. Mr. Daniels, by the rules of the House, had one hour to reply, after the expiration of the time for closing debate. He attempted to reply to some of the arguments offered against the bill, but advanced no new position. At the expiration of his speech, the vote was taken, and the bill reported to the House as agreed to in committee. The previous question was then called, and under its operation the bill passed, 79 members voting in favor of its passage, and 53 against it. One member from the slave states, Williamson R. W. Cobb of Alabama, voted against the bill. All the other members from the slave states voted for it, and were aided by the votes of members from the free states, as follows. From New Hampshire, Harry Hibbard, 1. Massachusetts, William Appleton, Zeno Scudder, 2. New York, Abram W. Schemerhorn, James Brooks, Gilbert Dean, F. S. Martin, Abram P. Stevens, Joseph Sutherland, 6. Connecticut, Collins M. Ingersoll, 1. New Jersey, R. M. Price, 1. Pennsylvania, Joseph R. Chandler, Thomas Florence, Joseph H. Coons, Joseph McNair, Andrew Packer, John Robbins, Thomas Ross, 7. Ohio, John L. Taylor, 1. Indiana, Samuel W. Parker, Richard W. Thompson, 2. Michigan, E. S. Penniman, Charles E. Stewart, 2. Iowa, Lincoln Clark, Bernard Henn, 2. California, Joseph W. McCorkle, 1. In all, the Free States, 25. The vote against the bill was given by the following members from the Free States. From Maine, E. K. Smart, Israel Washburn, Jr., 2. New Hampshire, Jared Perkins, Amos Tuck, 2. Massachusetts, Orrin Fowler, Z. Goodrich, Horace Mann, 3. New York, Henry Bennett, George Briggs, John G. Floyd, Timothy Jenkins, Daniel F. Jones, Preston King, William Murray, Joseph Russell, William A. Sackett, W. W. Snow, Hiram S. Walbridge, John Wells, 12. New Jersey, Charles Skelton, N. T. Stratton, 2. Vermont, Thomas W. Bartlett, James Meacham, 2. Connecticut, Charles Chapman, 1. Pennsylvania, James Allison, John L. Dawson, James Gamble, Galusha A. Grow, John W. Howell, Thomas M. Howell, Milo M. Dimmick, Thaddeus Stevens, 8. Ohio, Nelson Barrar, Joseph Cable, Alfred P. Edgerton, J. M. Gaylord, Alex Harper, William F. Hunter, John Johnson, Eben Newton, Edson B. Olds, Charles Sweetser, 10. Indiana, Samuel Brenton, John G. Davis, Graham N. Fitch, Thomas A. Hendricks, Daniel Mace, 5. Illinois, Willis Allen, R. S. Maloney, 2. Wisconsin, James D. Doty, Solomon Durkee, Benjamin C. Eastman, 3. These fifty-two members with Mr. Cobb of Alabama made up the entire opposition to the bill in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, there was very little opposition to its passage, and after thirteen years, the people of the United States paid for the slaves whom Watson bought on speculation, but of whom he failed to obtain possession. The northern advocates of the bill justified their support of it more generally upon the principle that our officers sent the Negroes west, and thereby rendered it difficult, if not impossible, for Watson to obtain possession of them, and they insisted that, in refunding to Watson his money, they did not pay him for human flesh, but for the money he had paid out, 
at the insistence of federal officers. This vote closed the controversy in regard to General Jessup's contract to give the Creek warriors such plunder as they might capture from the enemy. End of Chapter 17 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 18 of The Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Further Difficulties in Prosecuting the War. We now resume our chronological narration of events connected with the exiles of Florida during the year 1838. On the 14th of June, Captain Morrison arrived at New Orleans from Tampa Bay in charge of some 300 Indians and 30 Negroes, on their way to the West, he having been assigned to that particular duty. These Indians and exiles had most of them come to Fort Jupiter by advice of the Cherokees, and surrendered under the capitulation of March 1837. At the time they reached New Orleans, Lieutenant Reynolds was absent with his first emigrating party, and the thirty-one Negroes left at New Orleans were at that time in the hands of the sheriff. Captain Morrison felt it his duty to hasten the emigration of those whom he had in charge, and on the 16th he left that city with his prisoners for the Indian country, without waiting for the return of Lieutenant Reynolds. On reaching Fort Gibson, he delivered them over to the officer acting as Seminole agent for the western country, and they soon rejoined their friends who were located on the Cherokee lands. It may not be improper to state that in several of our recent chapters we have quoted from official documents pretty freely, for the reason that many living statesmen, as well as many who have passed to their final rest, were deeply involved in those transactions, and we desired to make them speak for themselves, as far as the documents would enable us to do so, but as we have narrated most of the scenes involving individuals in transactions of such deep moral turpitude, we hope to be more brief in our future history. When General Taylor assumed the command of the army, there was a feeling of deep disgust prevalent among the regular troops at the practice of seizing and enslaving the exiles. We have already noticed the fact that the citizens of Florida supposed the war to have been commenced principally to enable them to get possession of Negroes whom they might enslave. Indeed, they appear not to have regarded it as material that the claimant should have previously owned the Negro. If they once obtained control of his person, he was hurried into the interior of Georgia, Alabama, or South Carolina, where he was sold and held as a slave and the Florida volunteers, while nominally in service, appear to have been far more anxious to catch Negroes than to meet the enemy in battle. This feeling was so general among the people and troops of Florida that General Call, governor of the territory, recommended to the Secretary of War that military expeditions should be fitted out for the purpose of going into the Indian country in order to capture Negroes, who, when captured, should be sold, and the avails of such sales applied to defray the expenses of the war. It is easy to see that this feeling would lead the regular troops to entertain great contempt for the volunteers of Florida, and a corresponding feeling of hostility would arise on the part of such volunteers toward the regular troops. These feelings operated upon President Jackson in ordering the withdrawal of General Scott, and General Jessup sought to appease this hostility by obeying the dictates of the slave power. Indeed, whatever appears like a violation of pledged faith, or bears the evidence of treachery on the part of General Jessup, may probably with great justice be attributed to the popular sentiment of the territory. He had assiduously captured and delivered over to bondage hundreds of persons, whom he had most solemnly covenanted to protect in their persons and property. General Taylor discarded this entire policy. His first efforts were to make the Indians and exiles understand that he sought their emigration to the western country for the advancement of their own interest and happiness. Owing to these circumstances, there was scarcely any bloodshed in Florida while he had command. 
the army was no longer employed to hunt and chase down women and children who had been reared in freedom among the hummocks and everglades of that territory. There were yet remaining several small bands of Indians upon the Apalachicola River and in its vicinity. Most of the exiles who had a few years previously resided with these bands had been captured by pirates from Georgia and taken to the interior of that state and sold, as the reader has been already informed. Those of Econ Chattimico's and of Blunt's and of Walker's bands were nearly all kidnapped. But of the number of exiles who remained with the other remnants of Indian tribes resident upon the Apalachicola River, we have no reliable information. We are left in doubt on this point, as General Taylor drew no distinctions among his prisoners. He neither constituted himself nor his officers a tribunal for examining the complexion or the pedigree of his captives. He denied the right of any citizen to inspect the people captured by the army under his command, or to interfere in any way with the disposal of his prisoners. He repaired to the Appalachie towns with a small force about the first of October. Neither the Indians nor exiles made any resistance, nor did they oppose emigration. They readily embarked for New Orleans on their way westward. Their emigration was not delayed in order to give planters an opportunity to examine the Negroes. Under the general term of Appalachies, 220 persons were quietly emigrated to the western country. But as we have already stated, how many of them were Negroes we have no information. These people were also delivered over to the agent acting for the western Indians, and settled with their brethren upon the Cherokee lands. General Taylor now entered upon a new system for prosecuting the war, by establishing posts and manning them, and by assigning to each a particular district of the country over which their scouts and patrols were to extend their daily reconnaissances. Small parties of Indians and Negroes occasionally came in at different posts and surrendered under the Articles of Capitulation of March 1837, and on the 25th of February 196 Indians and Negroes were embarked at Tampa Bay for the western country. But the proportion of Negroes compared with the whole number is not stated in any official report. General Taylor, in his communications, speaks of them as prisoners, and occasionally uses the terms Indians and Negroes. Thus, in less than a year, General Taylor shipped more than 400 prisoners for the western country without bloodshed. These prisoners were also delivered over to the Indian agent of the western country, and immediately reunited with their brethren already located on the Cherokee lands. There were at that time a colony of more than 1,600 of these people living upon the territory assigned to the Cherokees. They were without homes or a country of their own, whereas the government had constantly held out to them the assurance that if they emigrated west they should have a country assigned to their separate use, on which they could repose in safety. At this point in our history, Mr. Van Buren's administration exhibited its deepest depravity. Since the ratification of the Supplemental Treaty of 1833, the executive, through all its officers, had assured the Indians and exiles that they should enjoy its full benefits by having a territory set off to their separate use, where they could live independent of Creek laws. Under these assurances they had received the pledged faith of the nation, that they should be protected by the United States in their persons and property. With these pledges, and with these expectations, a weak and friendless people had emigrated to that western region, and when thus separated from their friends and country, with the slave-catching vultures of the Creek Nation watching and intending to make them their future victims, the President deliberately refused to abide by either the treaty or the Articles of Capitulation. He left them unprotected, without homes, and without a country which they could call their own. True, many of them had been betrayed, treacherously seized, and compelled to emigrate, but this was done in violation of the existing treaty and pledged faith of the nation, which they were constantly assured should be faithfully observed, and these circumstances enhanced the guilt of those who wielded the executive power to oppress them. Major General McComb arrived in Florida May 20th for the purpose of effecting a new treaty with the Seminoles, upon the basis of permitting them to remain in their native land. 
the war had been waged with the intent and for the purpose of compelling the Indians to emigrate west and settle with the Creeks, and become subject to the Creek laws. It had continued three years at a vast expenditure of treasure and of national reputation. Many valuable lives had also been sacrificed, and although some two thousand Indians and exiles had emigrated west, not one exile had settled in the Creek country or become subject to Creek laws. Some hundreds had been enslaved and sold in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and South Carolina, but a remnant of that people, numbering some hundreds, yet maintained their liberties against all the machinations and efforts of government to re-enslave them. The vast expenditure of national treasure had called forth severe animadversion in Congress, while the entire policy of the slave power forbid all explanation of the real cause of this war, and of the object for which its prosecution was continued. Thus, while the nation was involved in a most expensive and disastrous contest for the benefit of slavery, the House of Representatives had adopted resolutions for suppressing all discussion and all agitation of questions relating to that institution. General Scott, a veteran officer of our army, had exhausted his utmost science, had put forth all his efforts to conquer this indomitable people, or rather to subdue the love of liberty, the independence of thought and of feeling, which stimulated them to effort. But he had failed. The power of our army, aided by deception, fraud, and perfidy, had been tried in vain. General Jessup, the most successful officer who had commanded in Florida, had advised peace upon the precise terms which the Allies demanded at the commencement of the war, and General McComb, commander-in-chief of the Army of the United States, was now commissioned to negotiate peace on those terms. But the first difficulty was to obtain a hearing with the chiefs who remained in Florida, in order to enter upon negotiations touching a pacification. To effect this object, recourse was had to a Negro, one of the exiles, who knew General Taylor, and in whom General Taylor confided. At the request of General McComb, this man was dispatched with a friendly message to several chiefs, requesting them to come into the American camp for the purpose of negotiation. His mission proved successful. A council of several chiefs, and some forty head men and warriors, was convened at Fort King on the 16th of May, 1839, and the terms of peace agreed upon. But no treaty appears to have been drawn up in form. On the 18th of May, General McComb, at Fort King, his headquarters, issued the following general orders. Headquarters of the Army of the United States, Fort King, Florida, May 18, 1839. The Major General, Commanding-in-Chief, has the satisfaction of announcing to the Army in Florida, to the authorities of the Territory, and to the citizens generally, that he has this day terminated the war with the Seminole Indians, by an agreement entered into with Chito Tostinugi, principal chief of the Seminoles, and successor to Arpieka, commonly called Sam Jones, brought to this post by Lieutenant Colonel Harney, 2nd Dragoons, from the southern part of the peninsula. The terms of the agreement are, that hostilities immediately cease between the parties, that the troops of the United States, and the Seminole and Miccosukee chiefs and warriors, now at a distance, be made acquainted with the fact that peace exists, and that all hostilities are forthwith to cease on both sides, the Seminoles and Miccosukees agreeing to retire into a district of country in Florida below Peace Creek, the boundaries of which are as follows, namely, beginning at the most southern point of land between Charlotte Harbor and the Sanibel or Caloosahatchee River, opposite to Sanibel Island, thence into Charlotte Harbor by the southern pass between Pine Island and that point along the eastern shore of said harbor to Tualkchopko or Peace Creek, thence up said creek to its source, thence easterly to the northern point of Lake Istokopoga, thence along the eastern outlet of said lake, called Istokopaga Creek, to the Kissimmee River, thence southerly down the Kissimmee to Lake Okeechobee, thence south through said lake to Ikahalatoli or Shark River, thence down said river westwardly to its mouth, thence along the seashore northwardly to the place of beginning. 
that sixty days be allowed the Indians north and east of that boundary to remove their families and effects into said district, where they are to remain until further arrangements are made under the protection of the troops of the United States, who are to see that they are not molested by intruders, citizens or foreigners, and that said Indians do not pass the limits assigned them except to visit the posts which will be hereafter indicated to them. All persons are therefore forbidden to enter the district assigned to the Indians without written permission of some commanding officer of a military post. By command of the General, Alexander McComb, Major General Commanding, to Edmund Shriver, Captain and Assistant Adjutant General. The country now again rejoiced at what the people regarded as the restoration of peace. By the terms agreed upon, the Indians retained as large a territory in proportion to the number left in Florida as was held by them at the commencement of the war. The people of Florida had originally petitioned General Jackson for the forcible removal of the Indians because they would not seize and bring in their fugitive slaves. They had protested against peace upon any terms that should leave the Negroes whom they claimed in the Indian country. These citizens of Florida had long since been driven from their homes and firesides by the enemy whom they so much despised, and they now desired peace. The Indians and exiles were also anxious to cultivate corn and potatoes for the coming winter, and were glad to be able to do so in peace. Thus the people of Florida, as they supposed, in perfect safety, returned to their plantations and resumed their former habits of life and the political party in possession of the government congratulated themselves and the country upon the fortunate conclusion of a war which had involved them in difficulties that were inexplicable. But this quiet continued for a short time only. Early in July, travelers and express riders were killed by small parties of Indians, plantations were attacked and the occupants murdered, buildings burned and crops destroyed, Families fled from their homes, leaving all their property, in order to assemble in villages in such numbers as to ensure safety to their persons, and the Florida War again raged with accumulated horrors. As an illustration of the manner in which it was carried on, we quote the following. Assistant Adjutant General's Office, Army of the South, Fort Brooke, East Florida, July ninth, 1839. Sir, it becomes my painful duty to inform you of the assassination of the greater part of Lieutenant Colonel Harney's detachment by the Indians on the morning of the 23rd instant on the Coolusahatchee River, where they had gone, in accordance with the treaty at Fort King, to establish a trading house. The party consisted of about twenty-eight men armed with Colt's rifles. They were encamped on the river, but unprotected by defenses of any kind and, it is said, without sentinels. The Indians in large force made the attack before the dawn of day and before reveille, and it is supposed that thirteen of the men were killed, among whom were Major Dalham and Mr. Morgan, suitlers. The remainder, with Colonel Harney, escaped, several of them severely wounded. It was a complete surprise. The commanding general, therefore, directs that you instantly take measures to place the defenses at Fort Mellon in the most complete state of repair, and be ready at all times to repel attack should one be made. No portion of your command will in future be suffered to leave the garrison except under a strong escort. The detachment will be immediately withdrawn. Should Fort Mellon prove unhealthy and the surgeon recommend its abandonment, you are authorized to transfer the garrison and reinforce some of the neighboring posts. I am, sir, George H. Griffin, Assistant Adjutant General, to Lieutenant W. K. Hanson, commanding at Fort Mellon. The Indians killed ten men belonging to the military service and eight citizens employed by the Sutlers, while Colonel Harney and fourteen others escaped. The Indians obtained fourteen rifles, six carbines, some three or four kegs of powder, and about three thousand dollars worth of goods. Lieutenant Hanson, commanding at Fort Mellon, on receiving the order which we have quoted, seized some thirty Indians at that time visiting Fort Mellon, and sent them immediately to Charleston, South Carolina, whence they were embarked for the Indian country west of Arkansas, where they joined their brethren who still resided upon the Cherokee territory. 
In these transactions, the exiles who remained in Florida appear to have taken no part, at least so far as we are informed. They labored to obtain the treaty of peace, but such was the treachery with which they had been treated, that they would not subject themselves to the power of the white people, and were not of course present at the treaty, nor were they recognized by General Macomb as a party to the treaty, or in any way interested in its provisions. Indeed, we are led to believe that General Macomb adopted the policy on which General Taylor usually practiced, of recognizing no distinctions among prisoners or enemies. The administration appeared to be paralyzed under this new demonstration of the power and madness of the Seminoles. At the commencement of the war, some officers had estimated the whole number of Seminoles at 1,500, and the Negroes as low as 400. They had now sent some 2,000 Indians and Negroes to the western country, and yet those left in Florida renewed the war, with all the savage barbarity which had characterized the Seminoles in the days of their greatest power. Indeed, they exhibited no signs of humiliation. The Secretary of War, Mr. Poinsett, a South Carolinian, probably exerted more influence with the President in regard to this war than any other officer of government. His predecessor, General Cass, had treated the exiles as mere chattel, having no rights. He had advised the employment of Creek Indians, giving them such Negroes as they might capture. He had officially approved the contract made with them by General Jessup. After he left the office, his successor, Mr. Poinsett, approved the order, purchasing some ninety of them on account of the government. He had advised Watson to purchase them, had done all in his power to consign them to slavery in Georgia. He was, however, constrained to make an official report upon the state of this war at the opening of the first session of the 26th Congress, which assembled on the first Monday of December, 1839. That report, when considered in connection with the events which gave character to the Florida War, constitutes a most extraordinary paper. Notwithstanding all the difficulties which he had encountered in his efforts to enslave the exiles, to prevent at least ninety of them from going west, and the complaints of the Seminoles who had emigrated to the western country at finding themselves destitute of homes and of territory on which to settle, he made no allusion to their troubles, nor did he give any intimation of the difficulties arising on account of the exiles, nor did he even intimate that such a class of people existed in Florida. He declared the result of General Macomb's negotiation had been the loss of many valuable lives. Our people, said he, fell a sacrifice to their confidence in the good faith and promises of the Indians, and were entrapped and murdered with all the circumstances of cruelty and treachery which distinguish Indian warfare. The experience of the last summer brings with it the painful conviction that the war must be prosecuted until Florida is freed from these ruthless savages. Their late cruel and treacherous conduct is too well known to require a repetition of the revolting recital. It has been such as is calculated to deprive them of the sympathy of the humane, and convince the most peaceable of the necessity of subduing them by force. It appeared necessary to raise the cry of treachery and cruelty against the Indians and exiles. They had no friend who was acquainted with the facts, that could call the attention of the nation to the treachery which had been practiced on them by the order and with the approval of the Secretary of War. No man was able to say how many fathers and mothers and children were, by the influence of that officer, consigned to a fate far more cruel than that which awaited the men under Colonel Harney at Coolusahatchee. In his report the Secretary most truly remarked, If the Indians of Florida had a country to retire to, they would have been driven out of the territory long ago. But they are hemmed in by the sea, and must defend themselves to the uttermost, or surrender to be transported beyond it. And he might well have added, when they shall thus be transported, they will have no country, no home. Indeed, the whole report shows that he relied on physical force to effect an extermination of the Indians and their allies. He looked not to justice, nor to the power of truth, for carrying out the designs of the executive. Men in power appear to forget that justice sits enthroned above all human greatness. 
that it is omnipotent and will execute its appropriate work upon mankind. Thus, while the people of Florida and Georgia had provoked the war by kidnapping and enslaving colored men and women to whom they had no more claim than they had to the people of England, while they had sent their petition to General Jackson, asking him to compel the Indians to seize and bring in their Negroes, and had protested against the peace negotiated by General Jessup in 1837, Mr. Reed, Governor of Florida, in an official message to the Territorial Legislature in December 1839, used language so characteristic of those who supported the Florida War, that we feel it just to him and his coadjutors to give the following extract. The efforts of the general and territorial governments to quell the Indian disturbances which have prevailed through four long years have been unavailing, and it would seem that the prophecy of the most sagacious leader of the Indians will be more than fulfilled. The close of the fifth year will still find us struggling in a contest remarkable for magnanimity, forbearance, and credulity on the one side, and ferocity and bad faith on the other. We are waging a war with beasts of prey. The tactics that belong to civilized nations are but shackles and fetters in its prosecution. We must fight fire with fire. The white man must in a great measure adopt the mode of warfare pursued by the red man, and we can only hope for success by continually harassing and pursuing the enemy. If we drive him from hummock to hummock, from swamp to swamp, and penetrate the recesses where his women and children are, if in self-defense we show as little mercy to him as he has shown to us, the anxiety and surprise produced by such operations will not fail, it is believed, to produce prosperous results. It is high time that sickly sentimentality should cease. Lo, the poor Indian is the exclamation of the fanatic pseudo-philanthropist. Lo, the poor white man is the ejaculation which all will utter who have witnessed the inhuman butchery of women and children and the massacres that have drenched the territory in blood. In the future prosecution of the war, it is important that a generous confidence should be reposed in the general government. It may be that mistakes and errors have been committed on all hands, but the peculiar adaptation of the country to the cowardly system of the foe, and its inaptitude to the operations of a regular army, the varying and often contradictory views and opinions of the best informed of our citizens, and the embarrassments which these cases must have produced to the authorities at Washington, furnish to the impartial mind some excuse, at least, for the failures which have hitherto occurred. It is our duty to be less mindful of the past than the future. Convinced that the present incumbent of the presidential chair regards with sincere and intense interest the afflictions we endure, relying upon the patriotism, talent, and sound judgment of the distinguished Carolinian who presides over the Department of War, and confident in the wisdom of Congress, let us prepare to second with every nerve the measures which may be devised for our relief. Feeling as we do the immediate pressure of circumstances, let us exert to the extremest point all our powers to rid us of the evil by which we are oppressed. Let us, by a conciliatory course, endeavor to allay any unkindness of feeling which may exist between the United States Army and the militia of Florida, and by union of sentiment among ourselves, advance the happy period when the territory shall enjoy what she so much needs, a long season of peace and tranquillity. Perhaps no vice is more general among mankind than a desire to represent ourselves and our country and government, to mankind and to posterity, as just and wise, whatever real truth may dictate. Surely, if General Jessup's official reports be regarded as correct, the people of Florida should have been the last of all who were concerned in that war to claim the virtue of magnanimity or forbearance, or to charge the Seminoles or exiles with ferocity or bad faith. The expression that it is high time that sickly sentimentality should cease manifests the ideas which he entertained of strict, equal, and impartial justice to all men. This message was an appropriate introduction to the legislative action which immediately succeeded its publication. 
It was that legislative body which first gave official sanction to the policy of obtaining bloodhounds from Cuba to aid our troops in the prosecution of this war. Of this atrocious and barbarous policy, much has been said and written, and its authorship charged upon various men and officers of government. At the time of the transaction it was represented that the bloodhounds were obtained for the purpose of trailing the Indians, and historians have so stated. But for various reasons we are constrained to believe that they were obtained for the purpose of trailing Negroes. It was well known that these animals were trained to pursue Negroes and only Negroes, they would no more follow the track of a white man than they would that of a horse or an ox. It was the peculiar scent of the negro that they had been trained and accustomed to follow. No man concerned in obtaining these animals could have been ignorant that they had, in all probability, never seen an Indian or smelt the track of any son of the forest. Every slaveholder well understood the habits of these ferocious dogs, and the manner of training them, and could not have supposed them capable of being rendered useful in capturing Indians. The people of Florida appear to have been stimulated in the commencement and continuance of this war solely by a desire to obtain slaves, rather than to fight Indians, and while acting as militia or as individuals, they were far more efficient in capturing Negroes and claiming those captured by other troops than in facing them on the field of battle nor can we resist the conviction that catching negroes constituted in the mind of general jessup the object for which those animals were to be obtained such was evidently his purpose when he wrote colonel harney as quoted in a former chapter if you see powell osceola tell him that i intend to send exploring and surveying parties into every part of the country during the summer and that i shall send out and take all the negroes who belong to white people and he must not allow the Indians or Indian Negroes to mix with them. Tell him I am sending to Cuba for bloodhounds to trail them, and I intend to hang every one of them who does not come in. We cannot close our eyes to the fact that General Jessup intended the bloodhounds to be used in catching the Negroes belonging to the white people, as he said. Those white people were mostly slaveholders of Florida, those who proposed in the legislative assembly of that territory the obtaining of the animals and adopted a resolution authorizing their purchase they did not wait for the president to act nor for the secretary of war whom the governor of florida characterized as that distinguished carolinian on whose judgment and patriotism the people of florida so much relied by resolution colonel fitzpatrick was authorized Quote, to proceed to Havana and procure a kennel of bloodhounds noted for tracking and pursuing Negroes. End quote. He was fortunate in his mission. He not only obtained the animals, but he accomplished the journey and reached St. Augustine as early as the 6th of January, 1840, with a reinforcement for the Army of the United States of 33 bloodhounds, well trained to the work of catching Negroes. They cost precisely $151.72 each, when landed in Florida. He also procured five Spaniards who were accustomed to using the dogs in capturing Negroes, and as the dogs had been trained to the Spanish language, they would have been useless under the control of persons who could only speak the dialect of our own country. The very general error that existed throughout the country at the time of this transaction arose from a misapprehension of the facts. There had been much said in regard to these bloodhounds before they were actually obtained. When the report of the War Department, under the resolution of the House of Representatives of the 28th of January, 1839, was published, containing the letter of General Jessup addressed to Colonel Harney, which we have quoted, many members of Congress appeared indignant at what they regarded as a stain upon our national honor, in obtaining and employing bloodhounds to act in concert with our troops and our Indian allies in this war. Party feelings ran high, and Southern members of Congress, who were acting with the Whig Party, were willing to seize upon any circumstance that would reflect discreditably upon the then existing administration. On the 28th day of December, 1839, the Honorable Henry A. Wise, a member of the House of Representatives from Virginia, 
addressed a letter to the Secretary of War, inquiring as to facts relating to the employment of bloodhounds in aid of our troops. To this letter, Mr. Poinsett, the Secretary of War, replied on the 30th of December as follows. War Department, December 20th, 1839. Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your letter of the 27th instant, inquiring into the truth of the assertion made by the public papers that the government had determined to use bloodhounds in the war against the Florida Indians, and beg to assure you it will give me great pleasure to give you all the information on this subject in possession of the department. From the time I first entered upon the duties of the War Department, I continued to receive letters from officers commanding in Florida, as well as from the most enlightened citizens in that territory, urging the employment of bloodhounds as the most efficient means of terminating the atrocities daily perpetrated by the Indians on the settlers in that territory. To these proposals no answer was given, until in the month of August, 1838, while at the Virginia Springs, there was referred to me from the Department a letter addressed to the Adjutant General by the officer commanding the forces in Florida, General Taylor, to the following effect. Headquarters, Army of the South, Fort Brook, July 28, 1838. Sir, I have the honor to enclose you a communication this moment received on the subject of procuring bloodhounds from the island of Cuba to aid the army in its operations against the hostiles in Florida. I am decidedly in favor of the measure, and beg leave to urge it as the only means of ridding the country of the Indians, who are now broken up into small parties that take shelter in swamps and hummocks, making it impossible for us to follow or overtake them without the aid of such auxiliaries. Should this measure meet the approbation of the Department, and the necessary authority be granted, I will open a correspondence with Mr. Evertson on the subject, through Major Hunt, Assistant Quartermaster at Savannah, and will authorize him, if it can be done on reasonable terms, to employ a few dogs, with persons who understand their management. I wish it distinctly understood that my object in employing dogs is only to ascertain where the Indians can be found, not to worry them. I have the honor to be, sir, your obedient servant, Z. Taylor, Brevet Brigadier General, USA, commanding, to General R. Jones, Washington, D.C. On this letter I endorsed the following decision, which was communicated to General Taylor. I have always been of the opinion that dogs ought to be employed in this warfare to protect the army from surprises and ambuscades, and to track the Indian to his lurking place, but supposed, if the general believed them to be necessary, he would not hesitate to take measures to secure them. The cold-blooded and inhuman murders lately perpetrated upon helpless women and children by these ruthless savages render it expedient that every possible means should be resorted to in order to protect the people of Florida, and to enable the United States forces to follow and capture or destroy the savage and unrelenting foe. General Taylor is therefore authorized to procure such number of dogs as he may judge necessary, it being expressly understood that they are to be employed to track and discover the Indians, not to worry or destroy them. This is the only action or correspondence on the part of the Department that has ever taken place in relation to the matter. The General took no measures to carry into effect his own recommendation, and this Department has never since renewed the subject. I continue, however, to entertain the opinion expressed in the above decision. I do not believe that description of dog called the bloodhound necessary to prevent surprise or track the Indian murderer but I still think that every cabin, every military post, and every detachment should be attended by dogs. That precaution might have saved Dade's command from massacre, and by giving timely warning have prevented many of the cruel murders which have been committed by the Indians in middle Florida. The only successful pursuit of Indian murderers that I know of was on a late occasion when the pursuers were aided by the sagacity of their dogs, these savages had approached a cabin of peaceful and industrious settlers so stealthily that the first notice of their presence was given by a volley from their rifles thrust between the logs of the house. 
and the work of death was finished by tomahawking the women after tearing from them their infant children and dashing their brains out against the doorposts. Are these ruthless savages to escape and repeat such scenes of blood because they can elude our fellow citizens in Florida and our regular soldiers and baffle their unaided efforts to overtake and discover them? On a late occasion, three of our estimable citizens were killed in the immediate neighborhood of St. Augustine, and one officer of distinguished merit mortally wounded. It is in evidence that these murders were committed by two Indians, who, after shooting down the father and beating out the son's brains with the butts of their rifles, upon hearing the approach of the volunteers, retired a few yards into the woods, and secreted themselves, until the troops returned to town with the dead bodies of those who had been thus inhumanly and wantonly butchered. It is to be regretted that this corps had not been accompanied by one or two hunters who, with their dogs, might have tracked the blood-stained footsteps of those Indians, have restored to liberty the captives they were dragging away with them, and have prevented them from ever again repeating such atrocities. Nor could the severest causist object to our fellow citizens in Florida resorting to such measures in order to protect the lives of their women and children. Very respectfully, your most obedient servant, J. R. Poinsett, to Honorable Henry A. Wise, House of Representatives. It is no part of our present duties to comment on the code of morals which the Secretary of War had adopted. He undoubtedly felt that neither the Indians nor Negroes possessed any rights which white men were bound to respect. He was not, he could not, have been ignorant of the cold-blooded massacre of nearly three hundred exiles and Indians at Blount's Fort in 1816, nor of the manner in which the present war had been brought on, nor of the objects for which it was prosecuted, nor does it appear possible that he, a large slaveholder of South Carolina, could have expected these bloodhounds would follow the trail of the Indians. But we must bear in mind that he had been exceedingly vexed with the indomitable resistance of the exiles. They appeared perfectly determined not to be enslaved, and that determination had given him much trouble, and he must have foreseen the defeat of his party in the next presidential contest, should all these facts become known to the public. With these feelings, he was prepared to apply almost any epithets to the Indians, as the friends and allies of a people to whose real character he dared not publicly allude, although they were occasioning the administration so much trouble. Having shown that no bloodhounds had been previously employed, he proceeded to argue the propriety of employing them in future, by adopting the policy proposed by the legislature of Florida, who, as we have already seen, had taken measures to obtain them some twenty days prior to the date of this communication. The Secretary of War thus exonerated himself and the Federal Executive from the responsibility of employing the bloodhounds on the 30th of December, and the animals arrived in Florida under charge of Colonel Fitzpatrick just one week subsequently to that date. One feature was most obvious in the commencement and prosecution of this war. We allude to the very respectful, almost obsequious obedience of the executive to the popular feeling in favor of slavery in every part of the country where that institution existed. This war had been commenced at the insistence of the people of Florida. General Jessup attempted to change the Articles of Capitulation, which he had signed, when the people of Florida protested against the peace, unless it were attended by the restoration of slaves. And now, when the popular voice of the nation had paralyzed the executive arm in regard to obtaining bloodhounds, the people of Florida, in their legislature, took up the subject and carried the policy into practice, so far as to obtain the animals. But that would be of no use unless they could be employed by the Army of the United States. Preparatory to this adoption of the purchase made by the legislature of Florida, Mr. Poinsett had argued the propriety of their employment in his letter to Mr. Wise, and twenty-six days afterwards he wrote General Taylor as follows. War Department, January 26, 1840. Sir, it is understood by the Department, although not officially informed of the fact, that the authorities of the territory have imported a pack of bloodhounds from the island of Cuba, 
and I think it proper to direct, in the event of these dogs being employed by any officer or officers under your command, that their use be confined altogether to tracking the Indians, and in order to ensure this, and to prevent the possibility of their injuring any person whatever, that they be muzzled and held with a leash while following the track of the enemy. Very respectfully, your most obedient servant, J. R. Poinsett, to Brigadier General Z. Taylor, Commanding Army of the South, Florida. From the commencement of this war, the officers of our army had found it necessary to employ persons who could communicate with the Indians in their own tongue. This was usually done through Negroes who could safely approach both exiles and Indians. They were, in fact, the only class of persons who could safely go from our posts to those of the enemy. No Indians could do it unless by arrangement made through those Negroes, inasmuch as Creeks, Chickasaws, and Choctaws were employed to act with our troops in hunting down the Seminoles, who shot those Creeks, Choctaws, and Chickasaws when opportunity permitted, with just as little ceremony as they did white men. When those Negroes visited the Seminoles, they were supposed to convey to them as accurate intelligence in regard to our troops as they brought back respecting the enemy's forces. They were, therefore, supposed to have put their brethren, the exiles, on their guard in respect to the bloodhounds. Understanding perfectly the nature and education of those animals, it does not appear very extraordinary to us that the exiles remained for a time in the interior, where neither bloodhounds nor civilized troops were accustomed to penetrate. This policy of the exiles rendered useless the whole expenditure of money and honor made in the purchase of bloodhounds and Spaniards with a view to their capture. But the animals had been obtained, and authority given to our officers to employ them. The Spaniards attended them, the dogs were attached to different regiments, and fed liberally on bloody meat. Young calves were provided, and driven with each scouting party to supply food for them. The Spaniards were supplied with a sufficient number of assistants to keep the dogs in their leashes. Thus provided, several parties composed of regular troops, militia, Indians, Spaniards, dogs, and calves, started for the interior, their marches continued in some instances for days, before they found even the track of an enemy, but when they found footprints of Indians, and the dogs were looked to with confidence to lead on the warlike host, while some more humble officer, following the canine leaders, Spaniards, and Indians, was expected to bear aloft the glorious stars and stripes, as they engaged in deadly conflict with the wily foe, Lo, just at that moment, when all hearts were palpitating, while hope was at its height, when the stern resolve clothed each brow with the dark scowl of battle, the dogs were blithe and frolicsome, but paid no more attention to the tracks of the Indians than to those of the ponies on which they sometimes rode. This grand experiment for closing the Florida War was now pronounced a dead failure, and the use of dogs— and calves, and Spaniards, was discarded, and the whole affair served no other purpose than to bring odium upon the administration, and ridicule upon the officers who proposed the employment of bloodhounds to act as allies of the American army. General Taylor, having had command of the army in Florida nearly two years, and the sickly season having commenced, requested to be relieved from that responsible station. His request was granted, and he left Florida for his plantation in Louisiana. Brevet Brigadier General Armistead, by order of the War Department, assumed the position from which General Taylor retired. End of Chapter 18 Recording by Maria Casper Chapter 19 of The Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hostilities Continued The presidential election of this year was conducted differently from any that had preceded it. The opponents of Mr. Van Buren arraigned him before the people for his extravagance in the expenditure of the public treasure and the immense losses which the nation sustained by the default and irresponsibility of officers appointed by him. 
It constitutes an era in our political history from which we date the practice of calling directly upon the people to pass judgment of condemnation upon the action of our national executive. Every honorable means was resorted to for the purpose of exposing the errors of the administration during the previous four years. Among the subjects made prominent before the country was that of the extravagant expenditures made in prosecuting the Florida War. Speeches were made in Congress exposing the various practices by which the people's money was squandered in that unfortunate conflict, the policy of attempting to compel the Indians to emigrate, and the cruelty practiced towards them, were commented on with severity. These speeches were printed in pamphlet form and sent to the people in vast numbers. But the real cause of the war, the deep depravity of that policy which sought the enslavement of the exiles, was not mentioned. Nor does it appear that any member of Congress was conscious even that such a people as the exiles was living in Florida. But nevertheless it is quite certain that this war proved one of the principal causes of Mr. Van Buren's defeat, and during the pendency of the election these complaints paralyzed the action of the executive. Another cause operated to call public attention to the war. Hon. William J. of New York published a small book upon the action of our government in regard to slavery. It was a work of much merit, and coming from the pen of one so intimately associated with the best interests of the country, it exerted an influence upon the public mind. It had been published some two or three years, but at the time of which we are writing it attracted attention in most of the free states, and gave public men to understand that their official acts were to be made known to coming generations. The intimate relation which this war bore to slavery rendered every movement in regard to it dangerous to the executive character, and caused our army to be almost inactive for several months. But the Allies, driven to desperation, prepared to wreak their vengeance on every white person who should venture within their reach. A small band, composed of Spanish Negroes and Indians, among whom were said to be some Maroons from Cuba, resided far down in the peninsula of Florida. They were called Spanish Indians, and had remained neutral up to the period of which we are speaking but finding their brethren driven from their own possessions and compelled to encroach upon the territory so long occupied by themselves, they took up arms against the United States. Every vessel that happened to be wrecked upon their coast was plundered and the crews massacred. On the morning of the 7th of August, a number of these people, said to have been led on by Spanish maroons, crossed over to a small island called Indian Key, situated at some twenty miles distant from the mainland, and attacked the dwellings, burned the storehouses, and destroyed most of the property belonging to the inhabitants. There were but four or five families resident on the island. Of these, Dr. Perrine, a man of some distinction, was murdered in his own house, but by his valor he enabled the other members of his family to escape amid the darkness of night. The Allies obtained much plunder, but found no powder, which was said to have been the principal object of the foray. During the summer and autumn our troops in Florida were inactive. The season was sickly, and the officers and men lay supinely in their encampments. The enemy felt secure in their strongholds, sallying forth in occasional forays, murdering people and plundering the settlements with impunity. The administration appeared astonished at the audacity with which a few Indians and Negroes hurled defiance at our army and the nation. The expedient of employing savages to assist in the war had failed. The more questionable policy of employing bloodhounds had not only failed, but was supposed by many to reflect discredit upon the army and nation. Nearly five thousand troops were kept in Florida, maintained at vast expense, but they could neither conquer the Indians nor even protect the white people. Under these circumstances the executive saw but one resource, of that he availed himself. By his direction, twelve Seminole and Miccosukee Indians who had emigrated west were induced by sufficient pecuniary considerations to leave their families in the western country and return to Florida for the purpose of persuading the Indians and exiles to emigrate, 
thus after four years of war and constant expenditure of blood and treasure the president discovered that moral power is greater and stronger than physical violence but this discovery came too late he could no longer do justice to those fathers and mothers and children who had been slain nor to those who had been enslaved who had been taken far into the interior sold and transferred from hand to hand like brutes they had passed from executive control the crime now stained our national escutcheon and no effort could wash it out the very means which he adopted to close the war operated to prolong it these seminoles and mikasukis informed their brethren of their own condition of the manner in which they were treated and the violations of faith on the part of our government in not giving them a territory for their separate use as stipulated in the treaty and constantly represented to them by our officers that they were without a home and without a country residing on cherokee lands under cherokee protection to prevent the creeks from enslaving their friends the exiles many officers at the time doubted their desire to induce the emigration of their brethren they however obtained an interview between the commanding general and two seminole chiefs at fort king the chiefs were attended by some forty warriors who remained in that vicinity four to five days receiving food and articles of clothing from the united states but they suddenly disappeared and it was believed they originally came with hostile rather than pacific intentions when it was found they had left clandestinely the troops attempted to follow them but were unable to find any traces of their flight while these things were transpiring the army lay idle in their quarters neither the executive nor the secretary of war nor the commanding general knowing what to do the exiles learned from the seminoles and mikasukis who visited them from the west that many of their brethren who had surrendered under the articles of capitulation had been re-enslaved in violation of our plighted faith and they refused to hold further intercourse with agents of our government to them there appeared but one alternative victory or death and they greatly preferred the latter to slavery taking their families far into the interior they hastened to renew the war with vigor and energy a party of some thirty indians and exiles were lurking about mecanopy when on the twenty eighth of december lieutenant sherwood lieutenant hopson sergeant major carroll and ten privates of the seventh infantry left mecanopy for the purpose of escorting mrs montgomery wife of a lieutenant of that regiment through the forest to watkahoota eight miles distant the lady was on horseback while others of the party rode in a wagon drawn by mules and some marched on foot the enemy having observed their movements preceded them to a hummock about four miles from mecanopy where they secreted themselves and awaited the approach of mrs montgomery and party when they were fairly within the hummock through which the road passed they were fired upon and two privates fell dead the war-whoop was raised and the little party found themselves confronted by savages lieutenant sherwood is said to have rallied his escort with promptness mrs montgomery attempting to get into the wagon was shot dead sherwood very discreetly retreated to the open forest and dispatched lieutenant hopson to mecanopy for a reinforcement knowing the impossibility of retreating from indians and conscious that they gave no quarter he bravely determined to defend himself or die on the field but his assailants numbered three times as many warriors as he had they outflanked and surrounded his ill-fated party all of whom with himself fell victims to that policy which had brought this war with all its crimes upon our nation we cannot withhold our sympathy from those patriotic men who enter the public service expecting to act in an honorable sphere in favor of just measures but who are often made the instruments of injustice and their lives sacrificed to the spirit and policy of oppression our officers and soldiers serving in this florida war were duly conscious of the dishonorable employment in which they were engaged that they were daily subjected to dangers and death for the purpose of enabling the people of florida to seize men and women and sell them into interminable bondage officers and men who would cheerfully meet danger and death upon the field of honorable warfare in defense of freedom were compelled to meet death in all of its various and revolting forms in florida to uphold oppression 
to sustain an institution which they abhorred, nor can we wonder that the consciousness of these facts should have created a feeling of hostility between our regular troops and the slaveholders of Florida, who were constantly charging them with inefficiency and want of energy in the capture of Negroes. This feeling ran so high that the white men of Florida were charged with disguising themselves as Indians and actually committing murders and robberies upon mail carriers and express riders in order to continue the hostilities and keep up the war. This feeling greatly increased the embarrassment of the executive. A chief named Cora Tustanugi, after due consultation with the interpreters sent to induce him to emigrate, concluded to surrender and go west. He collected his band, numbering about one hundred in all. Among them were some half-breeds, descendants of the pioneer exiles. They had intermarried with Indians of this band, and were treated as Indians. While on their way to one of our posts, near Palaklikaha Lake, they were fired upon by a party of dragoons who were said to have been conscious of the intentions of the Indians. This supposed violation of faith was greatly aggravated by the subsequent wanton murder of the chief, after he and his band had quietly submitted as prisoners. These people were immediately sent to Tampa Bay, and then embarked for the western country, where they joined their brethren, still resident on the Cherokee lands and under Cherokee protection. The presidential election being passed, the executive felt more untrammeled, and Mr. Poinsett, Secretary of War, resisting the instruction which he might have drawn from four years of unfortunate experience, appears to have determined to leave this Florida war in as unpromising condition as he found it. He sent instructions to the commanding general to renew the war with whatever force he could bring into the field. It is a somewhat singular fact that when the secretary understood, and the country was fully informed, that he would leave the department on the 4th of March, he wrote the commanding officer on the 18th of February, thirteen days prior to his own political dissolution, saying, The department entertains the well-grounded hope that you will be able to bring the war to a close upon the terms required by the Treaty of Payne's Landing, and by the interests and feelings of the people of Florida. The reader must be aware that the feelings and interests of the people of Florida required the capture and enslavement of the exiles, for which the Secretary of War had so long labored, and which appeared to be his ruling passion, strong even in the hour of his political death. To effect this object, recourse was had to the bribery of certain chiefs. Money was now offered to certain influential men of the Seminoles and exiles, to induce them to exert their influence with their friends to emigrate. It was reported that slaves who had but a few years since left their masters and intermarried with the Seminoles dared not surrender, knowing that slavery awaited such an act. Without them, their relatives and connections would not remove. It was therefore proposed that Congress should make an appropriation for the purpose of purchasing such exiles. Yet the bill making it was general in its provisions, granting a hundred thousand dollars to be expended by the Secretary of War for the subsistence and benefit of certain chiefs and warriors of the Seminole Indians who wished to emigrate. The subsistence of such emigrants was provided for in other bills, but the benefits, for which this money was to be expended, was to purchase the pretended interest of certain white men to individual exiles whom they claimed as property. By thus disguising the real intention and object of this bill, it was evidently expected it would pass without scrutiny, under the rules which prohibited the discussion of any question relating to the subject of slavery. The better to carry out this design, Honorable Waddy Thompson of South Carolina, a Whig member of the House of Representatives, but fully sympathizing with the executive in his policy of conducting the war in the manner required by the interests and feelings of the people of Florida, was regarded as the proper agent to introduce the bill and superintend its passage. The information found in the public documents had awakened previous investigation, and when this bill came up for action, February 9th, the policy of this war, with the causes which led to its commencement, were exposed, Every effort was made by slaveholding members to prevent the public discussion of this subject. 
they insisted that the gag rules, as they were called, prohibiting the discussion of slavery, forbid this exposure. But the presiding officer, Mr. Clifford of Maine, adhering to the parliamentary law, decided that an examination of the causes which led to the war was legitimate, and the discussion proceeded. The discussion was published and widely circulated among the people, and is supposed to have given the public the first information touching on the real causes of the war. The bill passed by a large majority, and the report of the Secretary of War the next year, showing the expenditures of his department, exhibited the manner in which the money appropriated and entrusted to his care was expended. Another bill, however, making an appropriation of more than a million of dollars for suppressing Indian hostilities in Florida was passed, giving the War Department all the power desired for bribery and tempting Indian chiefs to emigrate to the western country. By reference to the map of Florida, it will be perceived that the great swamps, extensive everglades, hummocks, ponds, and lakes, which spread over that territory, must present great difficulties in the progress of troops embodied in military force, while a small party, following the footsteps of their leader, would pass over, around, or through them with facility. The great Okefenoka Swamp, lying on the south line of Georgia and the northern portion of Florida, afforded a retreat for small parties of Indians and exiles, from which they sallied forth and committed depredations upon the people of southern Georgia, murdering families, burning buildings, and devastating plantations. The swamps bordering on the Withlacoochee, the Great Wahoo Swamp, and other fastnesses on the western portion of the peninsula gave shelter to other bands, who in like manner wreaked their vengeance upon the inhabitants of that portion of the territory. So also the Big Cypress Swamp, lying farther south, afforded shelter for others, who laid waste to the settlements along the St. John's River, and in the vicinity of the Atlantic coast. From these, and numerous other strongholds, the Indians and their allies came forth in small bands, spreading devastation and death throughout the territory and the southern portion of Georgia. The people of Florida, who had sought this war, and protested against peace, except on such terms as would secure them in the exercise of that oppression which they deemed so necessary to their happiness, now felt the full force of that appropriate penalty which some philosophers believe attaches to every violation of the law of righteousness. Some died by the hands of the very individuals whom they had oppressed, and whom they again sought to enslave. Others were again driven from their homes, unable even to obtain food, their wives and children receiving rations from the public stores, and subsisting by the charity of the United States. But this condition of things superinduced another most extraordinary feature of this war. Our officers and the executive, naturally feeling some degree of sympathy for a people thus driven from their homes, on whom the evils of the war fell with so much force, extended to them every aid in their power. Some were employed in the commissary's department, some as contractors for transporting provisions, and others as attendants upon the army in all the various departments of service so numerous in a time of war. Even the slaves who remained in the service of their masters were employed by the officers as guides, interpreters, and employees at high wages. In this manner they earned for their owners far more than they could by labor upon plantations. This system was carried so far that the war actually afforded to many greater profits than they could acquire in any other way, and, consequently, it became a matter of interest with such men to prolong the hostilities, and they were said to exert all their influence to effect that object. End of chapter 19. Recording by Maria Casper. Chapter 20 of the Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Hostilities continued. On the 4th of March, General Harrison was inaugurated President of the United States. Much was expected of him 
in regard to the war. The Whigs had condemned it throughout the presidential struggle, and it was anticipated that he would bring it to a successful and honorable termination. But before he even entered upon the consideration of this subject, he was called from this to another sphere of existence, and was succeeded by the then Vice President, John Tyler, of Virginia. Nor is it easy to see what great reform General Harrison could have effected in regard to this war, had he lived to complete his term of service. The policy of so directing the energies of the federal government, as to support the interests of slavery, had long existed. He was not expected to make any substantial changes in that respect, but whatever may have been his designs, he had no opportunity to carry them into effect and Mr. Tyler, after coming into office, soon ceased to enjoy the confidence of the Whig party, who generally declared themselves no longer responsible for his acts. The new administration soon identified itself with this war by the following order. Quote, Adjutant General's Office, Washington City, May 19, 1841. Sir, Brigadier General Armistead, being about to relinquish the command of the Florida Army, as you will see by the instructions communicated to him of this date, of which a copy is herewith enclosed, is the officer next in rank, you will relieve him and assume the command accordingly. I am directed by the Secretary of War to advise you of the interest desire of the Department to terminate as speedily as possible the protracted hostilities in Florida, and to cause the most perfect protection and security to be given to the frontiers, and to those citizens who may be disposed to penetrate the country for lawful purposes of trade or settlement. For the attainment of these important objects, you are considered as being clothed with all the powers of a commander in the field, under the laws and regulations of the army. It is expected the troops under your command will be kept in a perfect state of discipline, and that you make such disposition of them as to be in readiness to meet any contingency that may all for active and energetic movements, the execution of which is left entirely at your own discretion. If you should deem it indispensable for the protection of the frontier, the President directs that you make your requisition upon the Governor of Florida for militia not exceeding one regiment, which, if called out, you will cause to be mustered into the service of the United States, in the manner prescribed by the regulations, for any period authorized by the Constitution and laws. The Secretary of War, placing, as he does, entire confidence in your ability and patriotism, desires me to say that every possible aid and support will be afforded to enable you to bring to a close this protracted and most embarrassing war. As the commander of Florida, you will exercise a sound discretion in the use of the means placed at your disposal, and while these should be employed with the greatest efficiency, the Secretary of War directs that you will, consistently with the primary object in view, diminish, in a spirit of sound economy, all unnecessary drains upon the Treasury by discharging all persons employed in a civil capacity, whose services you shall not deem indispensable to the duties of your command, and by regulating and reducing as far as practicable all other expenses, in accordance with the just expectations of the government and the country. I am, sir, your obedient servant. Signed, R. Jones, Adjutant General. Colonel J. W. Worth, 8th Infantry. Tampa, Florida. End quote. General Worth now applied himself, with commendable zeal, to the work assigned him. His first object was to discharge all employees not necessary to the operations of the army, and in every department to curtail the expenditures as far as possible, thereby rendering the war unprofitable to those who had been seeking to prolong it. Early in June he issued the following order. Quote, Headquarters, Army of the South, Number 1, Fort King, 
June 8, 1841. 1. Hereafter no expenditures of money will be made on account of barracks quarters, or other buildings at temporary posts, except for such slight covering as may be indispensably necessary for the protection of the sick and security of the public stores, without previous reference to and authority obtained from headquarters. 2. All safeguards or passports granted to Indians prior to this date are hereby revoked. Any Indian presenting himself at any post will be seized and held in strict confinement, except when commanding officers may, in the exercise of sound discretion, deem it advisable to send out an individual runner to communicate with others. 3. When the garrisons are not too much reduced by sickness, detachments will be sent out as often as once in seven days, or more frequently, if circumstances indicate a necessity, to scour and examine in all directions to the distance of eight or ten miles. 4. All restraints heretofore imposed upon district commanders, in respect to offensive field operations, are hereby revoked. On the contrary, the utmost activity and enterprise is enjoined. District commanders will give instructions to commanders of posts accordingly. 5. Brief reports of the operations carried on under the foregoing orders, setting forth the strength of the detachments, and by whom commanded, with such observations as may be deemed useful or interesting to the service, will be made to district commanders on the 10th, 20th, and last of every month, by whom they will be transmitted to these headquarters. By order of Colonel Worth, signed G. Wright, Captain, 8th Infantry, and A.A.A. General. End quote. Halek Tustanuji was regarded as the most active and vindictive of the hostile chiefs. Among his followers were some forty Indian warriors and ten or twelve exiles capable of bearing arms. They and their families, numbering in all some two hundred souls, were supposed to be somewhere in the neighborhood of Lake Phoney Safaki, among the extensive swamps and hammocks of that region. Some few of this band had surrendered and gone west. Among those who came in to Fort Jupiter for the purpose of emigrating, were several exiles who had been born in that region, and had ever been connected with this small tribe. Some of those who had previously surrendered were retained as guides and interpreters, with the expectation that they might be made useful in persuading their friends to emigrate also. It was thought very desirable to capture this band, if possible, and guides and interpreters and scouts were sent in every direction, where it was supposed they might be discovered, in order to open a communication with them. At length it was reported that a trail had been discovered leading to one of their favorite haunts, where it was believed they might be found. We cannot better exhibit the dangers which constantly beset the exiles who remained hostile, or the vigilance with which they and their friends watched for their own safety, than by giving a short account of Colonel Worth's expedition for the capture of this small party, which we copy from Sprague's History of the Florida War. Says that author, quote, The Negro guides, recently of the band, represented it as his favorite resort from its seclusion, where he held his green corn dances and councils. Measures were at once adopted to follow it up. Colonel Worth, with one hundred men of the Second Infantry, accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Riley and Major Plimpton, together with Captain B. L. Beale's company, Second Dragoons, and forty men of the Eighth Infantry, in command of First Lieutenant J. H. Harville, moved from Fort King for Fort McClure or Warm Spring, thence, under the guidance of Indian Negroes, to the neighborhood of the lake. At midnight, on the night of the tenth, the swamp was reached, the troops having marched forty-four miles. To surprise the Indian camp, just at break of day, was the only chance of success. The guides represented it to be on the opposite side of the swamp, five or six miles through. The horses were picketed, and the baggage left with a small guard on the margin of the swamp. The soldier carried only a musket, and his ammunition, the officers a rifle or sword. 
Quietly and resolutely the command moved, confident of success. The water became colder and deeper at every step. Halts were frequently made to extricate the officers and soldiers from the mud. The night was dark, which added to the dismal gloomy shadows of a cypress swamp. The command can only follow by the splashing of water in the calm but firm intonations of the word of command. The negroes in advance, followed closely by the most hardy and active, guided these two hundred men to what was believed to be the stronghold of the enemy. Every hour and step confirmed this conviction. The advance reached the opposite side, just before the break of day. Anxiously they awaited and greeted every officer and soldier as he emerged from the swamp covered with mud and water. Day broke, when silently the command was given, Fall in. Eleven officers and thirty-five privates were present. Occasionally a straggler would arrive, and report those in the rear as coming. The Indian huts, by the gray dawn of morning, twenty-four in number, could be discerned through the scrub, which separated the white and red man, three hundred yards distant. At this hour the Indian around his campfire feels secure. From the number of huts and their location, they outnumbered the assailants. To await the arrival of the entire force, the day would be far advanced, and discovery was a total defeat. It was determined with the number present to make a vigorous assault, and, if outnumbered, to rely upon those in the rear. Each man reprimed his musket, and cautiously, on his hands and knees, worked his way through the dense undergrowth to within a few yards of the cluster of huts and temporary sheds. Not a word was uttered. Eagerly each man grasped his musket, anxious for the first whoop, when he would be rewarded for his toil. A musket was discharged to arouse the inmates and meet them on their retreat. It sent back its dull, heavy reverberation, causing disappointment and chagrin. Not a human being occupied the huts, or was upon the ground. End quote. Large fields of corn were before them. They had been carefully cultivated, and gave incontestable proof that the Allies had just left. This place had been the temporary residence of a strong force. But their patrols had discovered the approach of our troops, and communicated information to the party, in time to enable them, with their wives and children, to escape from danger. The officers and soldiers looked about, a while with wonder and then commenced the work of destroying the cabins and crops which being effected they retraced their steps to headquarters fully satisfied that a disciplined army was not adapted to the work of surprising indians and exiles perhaps no act or policy of general worth contributed so much to the favorable prosecution of the war as his treatment of koakuchi or wild cat as he was more recently called. This extraordinary personage became conspicuous in 1841. During the entire war, he deeply sympathized with the exiles, was always attended by some of his more dusky friends, in whose welfare he took a deep interest, nor has he yet forsaken them. Even at the time of writing this narrative, he is supposed to be with them, and a short notice of some of his more than romantic experience in this war may interest the reader in the fortunes of a man who may yet fill a large space in the history of our country. He was the son of King Philip, a seminal chief of some reputation. He is now, 1857, about fifty years of age, five feet eight inches in height, well proportioned, exhibiting the most perfect symmetry in his physical form. His eye is dark, full, and expressive, and his countenance youthful and pleasing. His voice is clear, soft, and musical, his speech fluent, his gestures rapid and violent, his views are always ingenious and clearly expressed, and he never fails to infuse all his measures with spirit and to exert a controlling influence over his followers. He was born near Ayapopka Lake, where he resided at the commencement of the Florida War, but soon after sought a more secure retreat in the large swamps near Fort Mellon and Lake Okeechobee. His band at that time numbered some two hundred souls, among whom were several families of exiles. In these sable warriors he is said to have reposed much confidence. 
he accompanied them at the massacre of major dade and his battalion in december eighteen thirty five here he formed his acquaintance with louis pacheco who acted as guide to major dade louis is said to have attended him and to have shared in every battle in which wildcat participated until the capitulation of eighteen thirty seven after that capitulation had been agreed to he visited general jessup's camp with the apparent intention of emigrating west he brought in some of his friends among whom was louis pacheco whom he claimed as his slave and declared that he had captured him at dade's massacre louis being a negro was placed within the stockade at tampa bay but wildcat of course went among his friends in the vicinity when he found that general jessup was violating the articles of capitulation and delivering over to slavery those exiles who were claimed by the people of florida instead of securing them in their lives and property for which the faith of the nation had been pledged he became indignant and insisted that every indian and exile who was enjoying his liberty should leave the encampment where they were receiving food and raiment from the united states and flee to their own homes McOpany, one of the most wealthy and influential chiefs refused and expressed his determination to emigrate wildcat and osceola powell two young and daring chiefs came to the tent of micopany at midnight and compelled him at the peril of his life to leave and flee to the indian country he did so and with him every indian in exile who was outside the stockade at tampa bay made their escape at the battle of fort mellon on the eighth of february eighteen thirty seven he is said to have commanded two hundred warriors, many of whom were exiles. He was at the Battle of Okeechobee on the 25th of December, 1837, the severest battle ever fought in Florida. Nearly all his warriors were with him. He was posted on the left of the Indian line, occupying the hommock when General Taylor approached. He declared that not an Indian gave way until the charge of Colonel Foster, although he said the fire of our men, quote, sent a stream of bullets among his warriors he stated the whole loss of the allied forces in that memorable conflict to be thirteen killed and nineteen wounded being less than one-fourth of general taylor's loss his father king philip being imprisoned at st augustine in eighteen thirty eight naturally felt desirous that his son should go with him to the western country where he knew he must emigrate he sent out a confidential friend with a message to wild cat inviting him to come and see him general jessup also sent assurances of his perfect safety if he wished to come and visit his father the messenger found him and faithfully delivered the message which his father sent there were also other indians and exiles going to fort peyton under the peaceful invitation and assurance of safety which general jessup sent them wild cat left his band and arrayed in his best robes bearing a white flag went with them and was betrayed through the agency of general hernandez into the power of general jessup as we have heretofore shown he was imprisoned in the castle at st augustine with his friend thomas hajo accustomed to roam in the forests at will and enjoy the free air of heaven this confinement bore down their spirits and affected their physical health he and his friend thomas hajo made their escape an account of which was given in a former chapter his father remained with the other prisoners was sent to charleston and subsequently died on his passage to fort gibson in eighteen thirty seven with the first party of emigrants under lieutenant reynolds wildcat now became one of the most active warriors in florida with his followers he repaired to the okefenoke swamp and encamping in its fastnesses sallied forth as occasion permitted and spread death and devastation in the southern settlements of georgia from thence he returned south and committed constant depredations both east and west of the st john's in eighteen forty his daughter an interesting girl of twelve years of age fell into the hands of our troops in a skirmish near fort mellon this was regarded as a most fortunate circumstance as it would be likely to procure an interview with the father miko a sub-chief and friend of wild cat was dispatched with a white flag on which were drawn clasped hands in token of friendship with a pipe and tobacco he found wild cat 
and delivered the message of the commanding general requesting an interview wildcat agreed to come in and gave miko a bundle of eight sticks noting the days which would elapse before he appeared in camp miko returned and made his report on the fifth of march wildcat was announced as approaching the american camp with seven of his trusty companions he came boldly within the line of sentinels dressed in the most fantastic manner he and his party had shortly before killed a company of strolling theatrical performers near st augustine and having possessed themselves of the wardrobe which their victims had with them he now decorated himself and followers in the most grotesque style he approached the tent of general worth calm and self-possessed and shook hands with the officers he addressed the commanding general in fluent and dignified language saying he had received the talk and white flag sent him that in pursuance of the invitation he had come to visit the american camp with peaceful intentions that relying upon the good faith of the officer in command he had entrusted himself to their power in order to promote the designs of peace which had been tendered him the dignity of his manner the gracefulness of his gestures the musical intonations of his voice the blandness of his countenance won the sympathy and commanded the attention of all around him at this moment his little daughter escaped from the tent where it was intended she would remain until general worth should feel that the proper time had arrived for him to present her to her father with the feelings and habits of her race she presented him musket balls and powder which she had by some means obtained and secreted until his arrival on seeing his child he could no longer command that dignity of bearing so much the pride of every indian chief his self-possession gave way to parental emotions the feelings of the father gushed forth he averted his face and wept having recovered his self-possession he addressed colonel worth saying quote, the whites dealt unjustly by me i came to them when they deceived me i loved the land i was upon my body is made of its sands the great spirit gave me legs to walk over it eyes to see it hands to aid myself a head with which i think the sun which shines warm and bright brings forth our crops and the moon brings back the spirits of our warriors our fathers our wives and children the white man comes he grows pale and sickly why can we not live in peace they steal our horses and cattle cheat us and take our lands they may shoot us may chain our hands and feet but the red man's heart will be free i have come to you in peace and have taken you all by the hand i will sleep in your camp though your soldiers stand around me thick as pine trees i am done when we know each other better i will say more End quote. general worth assured him of the good faith with which he should be treated that the feelings which he had expressed were honorable to him and to his people that the emotions manifested on seeing his child were highly creditable to him as a father assured him that his child should not be separated from him that the american officers and soldiers highly respected the parental affection which he had exhibited he then entered upon a consultation with him concerning the best mode of obtaining a peace wildcat spoke with great sincerity frankly stated the condition and feelings of this people stated the friendly attachment between the exiles and indians said that they would not consent to be separated that nothing could be done until their annual assemblage in june to feast on the green corn that hard as the fate was he would consent to emigrate and would use his influence to induce his friends to do so after remaining four days in camp he and his companions left accompanied by his little daughter whom he presented to her mother on reaching his own encampment prompt to his engagement with general worth he returned on the tenth day after his departure he stated that he could do nothing until june but expressed his desire to see general armistead the former commander who was yet at tampa bay with that officer he also made arrangements to do whatever was in his power to induce his friends to emigrate there appears no good evidence on which to doubt the sincerity of wild cat yet it appears that general armistead before leaving florida ordered colonel childs commanding at fort pierce to seize wildcat if he should come within his power with such followers as should attend him and send them to tampa bay for emigration 
General Armistead retired to Washington soon after issuing this order, leaving General Worth in command. On the 21st of May, Wildcat and his brother, together with an uncle, a brother of his father, King Philip, and twelve other Indians and three exiles, came into Fort Pierce, where Colonel Childs was in command. Wildcat and his friends had reposed perfect confidence in the honor and good faith of General Worth. He had been betrayed by General Hernandez, acting under General Jessup's orders, had been imprisoned, and suffered much, but from the manner and bearing of General Worth, he had been led to repose the most implicit confidence in his sincerity. Colonel Childs, however, punctilious in his obedience to orders, at once seized and sent him and his companions in irons to Tampa Bay, where they were immediately placed on board a transport and sent to New Orleans. En route for Fort Gibson. The people of Florida heartily approved this transaction, feeling that the territory was now rid of one of its most dangerous foes. General Worth soon learned the manner in which Wildcat had been again seized as a prisoner, in violation of the pledged faith of government. Mortified and chagrined, he at once dispatched a faithful officer, with explicit directions, to bring Wildcat and his friends back to Florida at the earliest moment at which he should be able. The officer found them at New Orleans, and forthwith started with them on his return to Tampa Bay. This measure of General Worth, though bold, and in direct opposition to the popular sentiment of Florida, probably tended as much to the pacification of that territory as any movement during the war. General Worth set out to meet the distinguished chief, and reached Tampa Bay on the 3rd of July. The next day he went on board the ship, where he met Wildcat and his companions. They were yet in irons. As they met upon the deck, the general took him cordially by the hand, assured him of his sincere friendship, of the mistake by which he had been arrested, but assured him that so great was his renown as a warrior, and such were the fears which the people entertained of him, that, as commanding general, he was constrained to hold him a prisoner. Perhaps nothing so touches the vanity of a savage as an expression of his greatness, and the consummate policy of General Worth was never more apparent than in the manner of his treating this savage chief. After recounting the devastation and death which Wildcat had scattered throughout the territory, he told him, with great emphasis, that he had the power to put an end to the war. He then told him he was at liberty to select five of his most trusty friends, and send them to his band, with such a message as would inform them of the precise state of facts, name the time necessary to gather his band, and have them at Fort Brook, that, if they failed to come in at the appointed time, he and his followers, who should remain with him, should be hanged. Wildcat listened with emotion. Most of his followers wept. After General Worth had closed his remarks, he arose, and, with great force of eloquence and truth, portrayed the wrongs to which he and his friends had been subjected. He then added, that they had fought the white people bravely, had killed many, but they were too numerous and too strong for them to contend with that they were compelled to submit. Then, in conclusion, he said he would send out his friends, and do what he could to induce his band to surrender for emigration. While he was speaking, the hour of twelve arrived, and an armed ship lying in port, opened her ports and commenced firing a national salute in honor of the day. Wildcat stopped, and, turning to General Worth, inquired the cause. It was explained to him and he readily contrasted his own situation and that of his friends, who were sitting around him in irons, with the condition of the free men to whom they were prisoners. After he had concluded his remarks, he gathered around him his friends, and, having consulted with them, he selected his five messengers, one of whom was taken from the exiles, and the other four from the Indians. The five messengers were brought together, and he addressed them in their own language, apparently with deep emotion. But when he came to inform them of the message they were to deliver to his wife and child, the feelings of the husband and father again overpowered him. He turned aside and wept, and such was the deep and thrilling interest which pervaded those around him, that the hardy sailors who had long been accustomed to danger, and the soldier who had become familiar with death in its various forms, were melted to tears. The sympathy became general, 
and all present seemed to acknowledge the reality of those holy affections of the human heart which God has implanted deep down in its core and centre. Silence pervaded the whole assemblage. The order was given by General Worth in a low and solemn voice to remove the fetters from the limbs of the five messengers. It was done quietly, and all looked on with interest. After the irons had been taken from their limbs, and all was prepared for their departure, Wildcat shook hands with each as they passed over the side of the ship. To the last he handed a silk handkerchief and a breastpin, saying, quote, Give them to my wife and child. End quote. The time which Wildcat had voluntarily set for their return was forty days. The band was supposed to be on the Kissimmee or St. John's River, and much interest was felt by all in the result. They greatly feared that delay might take place in finding and communicating with them. Officers and soldiers participated in the excitement, and the messengers were instructed by them to inform the commanding officer at that post, if any great delay should occur. The success of this mission is regarded as the turning point of the Florida War, and in its perfect success all felt a deep interest, as it was believed that his example would be followed by other chiefs of sufficient influence to bring this long, protracted war to a close. The officers visited Wildcat and his friends on board the ship daily, and endeavored to cheer them by constantly expressing their confidence in the fidelity of the messengers. He endeavored to surmount the anxiety and apprehension which his situation naturally brought to his mind, but his careworn countenance and anxious manner showed the corroding solicitude which he felt. Old Miko, the Indian chief who at first introduced Wild Cat to come into Fort Cummings, was at Tampa Bay at the time the messengers left. He was aged, but continued active. He had been the confidential friend of King Philip, the father of Wild Cat, and was now the warm friend of the son. He volunteered to accompany the messengers, assuring Wild Cat that he would himself return in ten days with such tidings as he should be able to gather in that time. The old man, faithful to his engagement, on the tenth day appeared at Tampa Bay with six warriors and a number of women and children, and reported that others were on their way. The return of Miko with such intelligence cheered his followers and friends, and gave to our officers and soldiers confidence in the entire success of the plan. But the chief continued to exhibit gloom, and at times he evinced despondency of spirits. In the meantime his people continued to arrive daily, and in less than thirty days his entire band was encamped at Tampa Bay. He had informed General Worth of the precise number of his warriors, by delivering to him a bundle containing one stick for each warrior. On the last day of July, it was found that the number of warriors, including exiles, exactly corresponded with the number of sticks. When informed that his warriors were all in, he resumed his natural cheerfulness. His countenance became lighted up with hope and intelligence. His bearing was lofty and independent. Several officers went on board to congratulate him. He was warmly greeted. He now, turning to the officer of the guard, in a tone of confident assurance, requested that his irons might be removed, and he permitted to address his warriors, as he said, like a man. His shackles were taken off, and he then dressed himself in a manner which he deemed fitting the occasion. His turban was of crimson silk, from which three ostrich plumes were gracefully suspended. His breast was covered with glittering silver ornaments. His many-colored frock was fastened around his waist by a girdle of red silk into which was thrust a scalping knife, enclosed in its appropriate scabbard. Red leggings and ornamented moccasins completed his attire. He was attended on shore by several officers, who took seats with him in the boat. As they approached the shore, and he saw his friends who had gathered at the landing to greet him, his heart seemed to swell with emotion. But gathering himself for the occasion, he became dignified and haughty in his deportment, and as he stepped on shore he waved his hand, beckoning them all to stand back. They impulsively obeyed, and raising his form to its utmost height, he sent forth a shrill war-whoop which reached every ear in the vicinity as the announcement of his freedom. A hearty response at once came back from every warrior of the band. The crowd simultaneously opened to the right and left, when, 
without noticing the presence of any person he at once proceeded to the headquarters where he met general worth whom he saluted in the most respectful manner he then turned to his people and addressed them stating the arrangement with general worth thanking them for so cheerfully coming to him declared they were now at peace with the white people he then inquired for his wife and child who had remained silent spectators of the whole scene they at once came forward and as he saw them the feelings of the husband and father again overcame him for an instant but resuming his lofty demeanor he mingled again with those faithful and tried followers who had so often stood beside him in times of peril such were the fortunes and such the character of one of those chieftains whom the incidents of the florida war brought into public notice he is now introduced to the reader and will continue to receive occasional attention until the close of our narrative and perhaps he may again appear in the future history of the people to whose trials and persecutions we are now directing attention we have felt this sketch due to the cause of truth inasmuch as during the war even up to the present day public newspapers have spoken of wild cat as a cruel and vindictive savage his efforts in behalf of freedom have been represented by public officers as crimes and he has been held up to the public as an unprincipled brigand we would judge him as we would all others by his acts wild cat's band now convened at tampa bay had been previously diminished by emigration it now numbered seventy-eight warriors sixty-four women and forty-seven children making in all one hundred and eighty-nine souls we have no official statement of the number of exiles who surrendered with this band we suppose however from the warm interest which wild cat always took in behalf of the exiles that more would have flocked to his standard than to those of other chiefs but we have no evidence that such was the fact probably the exiles constituted about one-sixth of the band that being the proportion of exiles who accompanied him to fort cummings and were seized with him by colonel childs indeed we have had no official data by which to determine the proportion of exiles who constituted the several parties that surrendered after general jessup left the army no subsequent commander in florida appears to have drawn distinctions as to the color of his prisoners they were all reported as seminoles and the term negro occurred only incidentally in their official reports when speaking of the class of interpreters and agents who were employed nor do we find that general worth made any effort to send any of his prisoners into slavery so far as we are informed like general taylor he treated them all as prisoners of war entitled to the same rights the same respect and the same attentions agreeably to the doctrine advanced by general gaines at new orleans general worth appears to have felt authorized to send every exile who surrendered to the western country if any of them were claimed by the slaveholders of florida he directed the proofs of ownership to be taken and the value of the negro estimated and then without waiting for further contest the negro was treated as other prisoners and sent west with his seminole friends leaving the government to pay for the slave or not as the executive and congress should determine it was this policy which enabled general worth to conduct the war with so much greater success than his predecessors it enabled him to avail himself of all the influence of wild cat now exerted in favor of emigration while general jessup by delivering over the exiles to slavery had induced the same chief to exert absolute violence to prevent emigration general worth having secured the friendship and cooperation of wild cat entered into consultation with him as to the best method of carrying out his plan of peaceful surrender of the indians and exiles and their emigration west those in the eastern part of the territory under hospitarche and tiger tail and sam jones were bitterly opposed to emigration they determined in council to kill any messenger sent to them for the purpose of persuading them to surrender or any one who should attempt to leave them for the purposes of emigration notwithstanding this determination some three or four families numbering in all about twenty souls made their escape august ten and though closely pursued reached the military post on pease creek and were sent to tampa bay where they joined wild cat's band otulke a brother of wild cat lived in the vicinity of those people who had become so indignant and it was deemed important to inform him 
of Wildcat's determination to go west. The chief had also a younger brother, now with the band at Tampa Bay, who volunteered to perform the hazardous duty of carrying a message to Otolki. Much solicitude was felt for his safety, but he accomplished his mission successfully. Otolki, with some six warriors and their families, obeyed the call, and came to Tampa Bay and joined the party destined for emigration. Otolki also brought a message from Hespitarche, an aged chief, the head of a small band numbering nearly one hundred souls. He was said to be eighty-five years of age, but was yet active, and possessed great energy. He sent a message to Wild Cat, that he too was coming in to see him. He was from the great cypress swamp, whose inhabitants were regarded as very treacherous and altogether destitute of integrity. A few days after Otolki arrived, Hospitarsh sent a boy with a white flag to Tampa Bay, saying he was old and fatigued, and wanted whiskey and provisions to enable him to reach Fort Brook. These were sent him, but the next day another message of the same character was received, and complied with. This practice continued for five days, and such was the desperate character of the old chief, that none of the friendly Indians dared go out to meet him, particularly as they learned that he was attended only by warriors. They believed he was intent on hostility, rather than peace, and they feared him. Wildcat had been absent for some days. When he returned, he ascertained the situation of Hospitarsh, with whom he had long been acquainted. The next morning he dressed himself in his gayest attire, and taking his rifle, mounted his favorite horse, which had been brought to Tampa Bay by his followers. The officers who witnessed his departure declared that the noble animal exhibited evidence of having recognized his master. No sooner had Wildcat mounted than he began to champ his bit and paw the earth, as if impatient to bear forth his rider to the hunting grounds. Wildcat, sitting upon his spirited horse, shook hands with General Worth and the other officers, and then dashed into the forest, and before sunset, returned with his venerable friend, Hospitarsh, and eighteen warriors. After they arrived, they were treated kindly, but placed under a strong guard. They sent confidential friends, however, to their homes, who in a few days returned, bringing with them the women and children of the whole band. They were now at Tampa Bay, nearly three hundred prisoners, ready for emigration, including exiles, supposed to be about sixty in number. While General Worth was thus successful in his efforts to induce the Indians and their allies peacefully to emigrate, he was pained to witness the sufferings to which his army were subjected. As an illustration of the sacrifice which our nation made in this effort to enslave the exiles, we would state that the 1st Regiment of Infantry, under Colonel Miller, came to Florida in 1838, and left in August 1841. It numbered some 600 men, and during the three years of its residence in Florida, 135 soldiers and six commissioned officers died of sickness. This we believe to be nothing more than the average loss of the troops who served in that war, in proportion to the time of service. The official reports for July 1841 show 2,428 men on the sick list, unfit for duty, being considerably more than one half of the whole army. A few Indians and exiles, from various bands, occasionally arrived at Tampa Bay and joined the emigrating party. Throughout the different families, they appeared to believe that General Worth was acting in good faith. The whole character of the war had undergone a change. It had originally been commenced and prosecuted for the purpose of re-enslaving exiles. Now that object, so far as they could discover, appeared to have been given up. Exiles and Indians were treated alike. Wildcat, their most active and popular chief, and the leading exiles with him, were acting with sincerity in favor of emigration. The war was, in fact, suspended for the adoption of a more pacific policy which seemed to promise success. Tiger Tail was yet inexorable and inveterate. He was said to have murdered his own sister for proposing to surrender, yet a small party from his band escaped to Tampa Bay and were protected. A few other Indians and exiles were captured without bloodshed, and such were the prospects of returning peace that by the commencement of September, General Worth informed the War Department that the 3rd Regiment of Artillery could be spared from the service in Florida, 
and that he hoped, within a month, to discharge the 4th and 5th Infantry and the 3rd Dragoons. Wildcat visited Tiger Tail in his retreat, which was regarded as a most hazardous undertaking. With six followers he started on a visit to this barbarous chief. He reached the vicinity of his camp near nightfall, but deemed it prudent not to approach at that late hour of the day. He and his friends, fearing discovery, bivouacked in a grove, supposing that they had not been noticed by any one. In the darkness of the night they heard slight movements near them. Wildcat suspected it was the weary chief, preparing to massacre himself and friends. He boldly called out, announcing his own name, and telling Tiger Tail not to come upon him like a coward, by stealth, but to speak frankly, or come up boldly to a personal conflict. Tiger Tail, surprised and astonished at this course, commenced conversation. Wildcat, referring to their former friendship, avowed his desire to renew the attachment, or, if Tiger Tail insisted on fighting, then he would meet him in a manner becoming a bold warrior. The ferocity of Tiger Tail gave way. They agreed to meet next day, when the long consultation was held. The savage chief gave assurances of his peaceful disposition, and promised to reflect upon the propriety of emigrating. Wildcat also sent to other chiefs messages, assuring them of his intention to emigrate, that his band, and that of Hospitarche, with individuals from other villages, were at Tampa Bay with the intention of soon embarking for the western country. Tiger Tail insisted on seeing Alligator, a Seminole chief, who emigrated in 1837, saying, if Alligator would come back and advise him to go west, he would comply with such advice. A messenger was accordingly sent west to bring Alligator to Florida. In the meantime, Wildcat declared to General Worth that he desired to see his own people on their way, and assigned as the reason for such desire that Indians were a restless people, and could not be long kept inactive, with no employment for either body or mind. The advice was received by General Worth with respect, and he at once gave orders to prepare for the journey. Transports had been employed, and were then in waiting. The women and children were engaged in cracking corn, to serve as food for their journey. Amid all the cares which surrounded him, General Worth endeavored to make both Indians and exiles comfortable, and render them cheerful. They were a wronged and persecuted people, about to leave their homes, their native country, and go to a distant region of which they were ignorant. Driven from the graves of their fathers, they were about to be separated from scenes which had been familiar to them from childhood. Of those who had come in for emigration, fifteen had died. While Cat detailed from his band seven, and Hospitarche detailed ten warriors, who, with their families, making some eighty souls in all, were to remain with General Worth for a while, in order to exert what influence they could with their friends in favor of emigrating to the West. The number who actually embarked was little more than two hundred and fifty, exclusive of fourteen Miccosukees, who persisted in drawing their rations, and in all things being separated from the others. Some fifty exiles are supposed to have been among those who embarked, and two of the seventeen families who remained at Tampa Bay were of mixed blood. The emigrants were all on board the transports, when General Worth and staff paid them a last visit. The scene was said to be affecting. Hospitarche, venerable for his years, sat in silence, resting his head upon his hands, and looking back upon his native land. He appeared disqualified for holding conversation with any one, and none appeared willing to disturb his seeming melancholy reflections. The women, both exiles and Indians, were weeping and sighing, unrestrained by that dignity so much cultivated by savages of the other sex. The warriors, black and red, were solemn and silent. This appeared to give Wildcat pain. He stood upon the quarter-deck with his sub-chiefs around him. As General Worth was about to take leave, quote, I am looking, said Wildcat, at the last pine-tree of my native land. I am about to leave Florida forever, and I can say that I have never done anything to disgrace the land of my birth. It was my home. I loved it as I loved my wife and child. To part from it is like separating from my own kindred. But I have thrown away the rifle. I have shaken hands with the white man, and I look to him for protection. End quote. He then addressed General Worth, 
thanked him for all his kindness and confidence, and on behalf of his people he expressed a high sense of gratitude for the humanity and friendship extended to them. Then extending his hand to the general, he bade him farewell. General Worth, in taking leave, expressed the hope that they would have a pleasant journey, and find themselves happy in their western homes. They parted. The anchor was hauled up, the sails hoisted, and the unhappy emigrants soon cast their last lingering look upon the long-loved scenes of their childhood. They were hurried on their way as rapidly as wind and steam could propel the ships in which they embarked. They made a short stay at New Orleans, and in two weeks from the time they left Tampa Bay, they landed at Fort Gibson, and were conducted to the settlement made by their brethren, who had previously emigrated. Here Wildcat found himself in a new sphere, respected and beloved by his followers for his gallant bearing, his undoubted courage, his devotion to the interests of his people, his truth and justice, distinguished above all others of his tribe by his warlike exploits. He was qualified and prepared to enter upon the trying scenes which awaited his future life. End of chapter 20 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 21 of The Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Close of the War. On the 14th of October, Alligator, with two other chiefs and one of the leading exiles named James, reached Fort Brooke on their return from the western country. They came at the request of General Worth to exert their influence with Tiger Tail and others in favor of emigration. The next day they left for the interior, and after an absence of seven days, returned with Tiger Tail. The General held several conversations with him, and kindly expressed his sympathy for the Indians, explaining his own situation and duty and advising the Indians to emigrate as their best policy. Tiger Tail, after remaining in camp four days, returned for his band, and friendly Indians were dispatched by General Worth to Sam Jones and other chiefs to induce them to also come in. Some thirty Indians deserted Halleck Tustanuji, November 10th, and came to Fort Brook. The appearance of Indians and exiles was so pacific that the commanding general discharged from further service in Florida five companies of dragoons, who were ordered to the western frontier. The Indians and exiles who remained at Fort Brooke when Wildcat and his party left for the west were active in their endeavors to induce their other friends to emigrate. In these efforts they were at least partially successful small parties from the bands of Tiger Tail and Athloki Mothla arrived occasionally, and with the apparent consent of those chiefs, but Tiger Tail himself appeared suspicious and wary. He would not come in then, but promised to do so at some future day. The influence of most of the exiles now remaining in Florida was exerted in favor of emigration. It is believed that nearly every family of pure exile blood had left, that the last of that class had departed with Wild Cat, particularly all of the descendants of those pioneers who remained unconnected with the Indians by marriage. There were yet remaining a few who had more recently fled from their masters in Florida and Georgia. They dared not trust themselves within the power of our troops, lest they should be reconsigned to slavery. They exerted a strong influence with the Indians against emigration. There were also, in almost every band and small village of Indians, exiles who had intermarried with Indian families. They could not well separate from their family connections, and therefore refused to surrender for emigration, until those relatives would go with them. By the 20th of November, fifty-two warriors, 
and a hundred and ten women and children, making in all one hundred and sixty-two people, were gathered from the bands of Tiger Tail and Ethlogi Mathla, some thirty of whom were exiles, intermarried with the Indians and half-breeds. Captain Wade made a foray into the Indian country, and captured some sixty-five Indians and exiles of two different bands, by surprise, and without bloodshed. They were mostly women and children, and were at once sent forward to Tampa Bay for emigration. About the close of November, Wax Hajo, a young chief from the Cypress Swamp, with seventeen warriors and more than thirty women and children, some ten or twelve of whom were half-breeds, descendants of exiles and Seminoles, surrendered, and were sent to Fort Brooke for emigration. While everything thus wore the appearance of peace, and all were regarding the war as near its close, a small settlement of white people, at a place called Mandarin, twenty-two miles from Jacksonville, was assailed in open day, and five of the people murdered. This attack was conducted by a small party of Indians, less than twenty in number, who had come from the interior, and in a stealthy manner approached the settlement, committed the murders, and retired before any troops could be brought to the scene of slaughter. Near the close of the year, the authorities of Georgia and Florida gave evidence of their dissatisfaction of the manner in which General Worth was conducting the war. The militia of neither Florida nor Georgia were called on to participate in the war. New opportunities were afforded them of seizing Negroes and selling them into slavery. None but the regular settlers were permitted to encamp with or near the troops. In short, the war, as then conducted, afforded them but little profit. General Worth had encouraged the return of the people to their homes and plantations, and very few of them now drew rations from the public stores for their support. He had discharged citizens and their slaves from public employment, and the war was carried on without permitting the people or politicians of Georgia or Florida to interfere or dictate the manner of its prosecution. This proceeding of General Worth greatly excited the people and executive of Georgia, who insisted upon furnishing militia to carry on the war. The Secretary of War referred the matter at once to General Worth, and a most interesting and amusing correspondence followed between the executive of Georgia and the commanding general. The latter refusing to call for militia from that state, they were mustered without his authority, and he was requested by Governor MacDonald to withdraw the United States forces from the Georgia frontiers. As there was then no enemy near that state, and no danger to the inhabitants, he removed the troops, and the Georgia militia were ordered by the governor to take their place. They did so with the confident expectation that General Worth would furnish rations and hospital supplies and arms from the United States stores. But he refused to do this, and the gallant militia of that state immediately retired to their homes in order to dine. The correspondence on this subject continued until May 1842, and shows the skillful management of individuals to get up alarms in regard to the supposed presence of hostile Indians, and thereby manifest the necessity of posting troops in certain localities, where there had probably never been an enemy. To give importance to these counterfeited alarms, letters were written, and presentments were made by grand juries. The delegate from the territory of Florida demanded of the executive the employment of militia for the protection of the frontier, and that such militia be authorized to act independently of the commanding general. Hon. John C. Spencer, Secretary of War, replied that the department could see no particular advantage to be derived from such a division of the duties of the commanding general, and as he had no doubt General Worth would do whatever was proper, he referred the whole matter to his consideration. Had General Jessup, in 1836 and 37, adopted the policy which guided General Worth, had he sent his prisoners to the western country, without permitting the militia, or the people of Florida, to seize and enslave those whom he had engaged to protect and defend, there is little doubt that the war would have been closed during the time he was employed in Florida. During the last days of December, 
Tustanuji Chopko, a sub-chief, and about seventy followers, consisting of warriors, women, and children, a proportion of whom were exiles and half-breeds, surrendered near the great cypress swamp, and were also sent to Fort Brooke for emigration. At the commencement of this year, several more companies of troops were discharged, the number of the enemy being so far diminished as to render their presence useless. On the 5th of February, some 350 Indians and exiles were embarked at Tampa Bay for the western country. They in due time reached Fort Gibson, and took up their residence with those who had gone before them, and were still residing upon the lands of the Cherokees. On the 14th of February, General Worth addressed the commanding general of our army at Washington City, a communication giving a detailed statement of the number of Indians yet remaining in Florida, amounting in all to three hundred, according to the best information he had been able to obtain. He also stated the impossibility of capturing these individuals, scattered as they were over a vast extent of country, and advising that they be dealt with, henceforth, in a peaceful manner, and that at least five-sixths of the troops then employed in Florida be withdrawn, and an equal proportion of the expenses of the war be curtailed. He proposed sending a portion of those friendly Indians who remained at Fort Brook among the hostiles to continue with them and exert what influence they could in favor of peace and of immigration, with the assurance that no further hostilities would be prosecuted by the United States while the Indians remained peaceful. The proposition, however, was rejected by the executive, and General Worth continued to carry forward the work which he had prosecuted thus far with such signal success. He dismissed more troops from service in Florida, discharged employees in the various departments under his command, and made such retrenchments as he was able to effect, without detracting from the efficiency of the public service. On the 16th of April, the troops fell in with Halek Tustanuji, who, with some seventy warriors of his own, and other bands, was encamped upon an island in the great Wahoo Swamp, and after an irregular fight of two hours routed them. The loss was slight on both sides. Our troops had one man killed and four wounded, the Allies three wounded, whom they carried from the field. This was the last battle fought in the Florida War. The Indians scattered in various directions, and in that way evaded pursuit. Halek Tustanuji was a most skillful warrior, bold and daring in his policy, yet capable of dissimulation and treachery. He had been the object of pursuit for two years. His unceasing vigilance had enabled him to bid defiance to civilized troops. He was now nearly destitute of powder and provisions, and as an alternative professed a desire for peace. He came into the American camp boldly, shook hands with General Worth, and proclaimed his pacific purpose. His provisions were treated with great apparent respect. He wanted provisions for his band. They were encamped within three miles of General Worth's headquarters, and were fed at public expense. And when the whole band had come within the lines, for the purpose of attending a feast, they were secured as prisoners, and immediately sent to Tampa Bay for emigration. And on the 14th of July, this entire band, consisting of 120 persons, embarked for Fort Gibson by way of New Orleans. They reached their destination in safety, and most of them took up their residence with their brethren, the Seminoles, while others joined the Creeks. The Federal Executive, having more maturely considered the suggestions of General Worth, at length concluded to accede to his propositions for a pacification with the remaining hostiles in Florida. That officer, having secured Halek Tustanuji and his band, and sent them west, now dispatched his messengers to those small bands of hostiles which remained, inviting them to hold a council, and enter into an arrangement, based upon the condition, that the Allies should remain in the southern portion of the peninsula of Florida, confined to certain limits, and abstain from all acts of aggression upon their white neighbors. Most of these small bands sent chiefs, or sub-chiefs, to attend the council, and terms of peace were agreed to, and the following general order was issued. Quote, order. Headquarters, Ninth Military Department, Number 28, 
Cedar Key, Florida, August 14, 1843. It is hereby announced that hostilities with the Indians within this territory have ceased. Measures are taken to pass the few remaining Indians within certain limits, those in the far south immediately, those west of the Suwanee in a few days, who, meantime, there is every reasonable assurance, will conduct inoffensively, if unmolested in their haunts. The lands thus temporarily assigned, as their planting and hunting grounds, are within the following boundaries, to wit, from the mouth of Telechopco, or Pease Creek, up the left bank of that stream to the fork of the southern branch, and following that branch to the head or northern edge of Lake Isto Capoga, thence down the eastern margin of that lake to the stream which empties into the Kissimmee River, following the left bank of the said stream and river to where the latter empties into Lake Okeechobee, thence down due south through said lake and Everglades to Shark River, following the right bank of that river to the Gulf, thence along the Gulf shore, excluding all islands between Punta Rosa and the head of Charlotte's Harbor, to the place of beginning. The foregoing arrangements are in accordance with the instructions of the President of the United States. By order of Colonel Worth, S. Cooper, A. A. General. End quote. Most of the troops were now withdrawn from Florida. General Worth retired from the command, and the Florida War was supposed to have ended. It had been commenced with the determination to re-enslave the exiles. That object was, in part, attained. More than 500 persons were seized and enslaved between the 1st of January, 1835, and the 14th of August, 1843. Probably one half of them had been born free. The others had themselves escaped from slavery. To effect this object, forty millions of dollars were supposed to have been expended. Eighty thousand dollars was paid from the public treasury for the enslavement of each person, and the lives of at least three white men were sacrificed to ensure the enslavement of each black man. The deterioration of our national morality was beyond estimate, and the disgrace of our nation and government are matters incapable of computation. The suffering of the Indians and exiles amidst such prolonged persecution such loss of lives and property we cannot estimate. The friends and families who were separated, the number of those who were made wretched for life, the broken hearts, we will not attempt to enumerate. Nearly one half of the whole number were consigned to the moral death of slavery, and many to that physical death which was dreaded far less than slavery. After wandering in the wilderness thrice forty years, they fell under the oppression, the persecution, the power of a mighty nation, which boasts of its justice, its honor and love of liberty. We lament the sad fate of those who died in that struggle, but with deeper anguish and far keener mortification, we deplore the unhappy lot of those who were doomed to drag out a miserable existence amidst chains and wretchedness, surrounded by that moral darkness which broods over the enslaved portion of our fellow beings in the southern states. There are yet remaining in Florida a few descendants of the pioneer exiles. They are intermarried with the bands of Billy Bowlegs and of Sam Jones, sometimes called Arapica. They are now mostly half-breeds, and are rapidly becoming amalgamated with the Indian race. Besides these, there are a number of Spanish refugees, or colored people who fled from Spanish masters, and took up their residence with those called Spanish Indians. These did not engage in the war until 1840, nor did they then engage in any of the battles with our army. They contented themselves with plundering ships wrecked on their coast, and the foray upon Indian Key. They refused to send delegates to the council summoned by General Worth, to establish terms of pacification. They live independent of the white people, subsisting mostly on fish and the natural products of the soil holding very little intercourse with other white men or other Indians. Descendants of exile parents, they have the complexion and appearance of pure Spaniards, but they are rapidly blending with the Indians and forming a mixed race. These different bands, remaining in Florida and aggregating into a distinct people, have on several occasions since 1843 
given evidence of implacable hostility to the whites, and at the time of writing this narrative, they are engaged in open war, while the government of the United States is endeavoring to secure peace in the same manner, and upon the same terms on which General Worth obtained it in 1843. Their future history may, hereafter, occupy the pen of some other historian. End of chapter 21 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 22 of The Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. History of Exiles Continued the exiles were now all located on the Cherokee lands, west of the state of Arkansas. They had been removed from Florida at great expense of blood and treasure, but they were yet free, and the object of the administration had not been attained. Conscious of the designs of the Creeks, the Seminoles and exiles refused to trust themselves within Creek jurisdiction. They were tenants at will of the Cherokees, whose hospitality had furnished them with temporary homes until the government should fulfill its treaty stipulations in furnishing them a territory to their separate use. Abraham was perhaps the most influential man among the exiles. He had been a witness and interpreter in making the Treaty of Payne's Landing, and had dictated the important provision in the supplemental treaty. He had exerted his influence in favor of emigration, to him, therefore, his people looked with more confidence than to any other individual. In all his intercourse with our officers, he had been assured of the intention to fulfill those treaties, and when he found the government hesitating on that point, he became indignant, and so did others of his band. But he could only express his indignation to the agent appointed to superintend their affairs and supply their wants. These complaints were made known to the Indian Bureau at Washington, but they were unheeded, and the exiles and their friends lived on in the vain hope that the administration would at some day redeem the pledged faith of our nation, and assign them a territory for their separate use, where they could live independent of the Creeks, as they had done for nearly a century past. Nor is it easy for men at this day to appreciate that feeling which so stubbornly sought their enslavement. We can only account for this unyielding purpose from the long-established practice of so wielding the power and influence of the nation as best to promote the interests of slavery. It is certain that it would have cost the United States no more to set off to the exiles and Seminole Indians a separate territory on which they could live free and independent, than it would to constrain them to settle on the creek lands and subject them to creek laws and creek despotism and creek servitude. General Jackson, in 1816, had ordered Blount's Fort to be destroyed, and the Negroes returned to those who owned them. To effect this latter object, in 1822, he proposed to compel the Seminole Indians to return and reunite with the Creeks, if at any time there were other reasons for the frauds committed upon the exiles and Indians, for the violations of the pledged faith of the nation, it is hoped that some of the officers who acted a prominent part in those scenes of treachery and turpitude, or their biographers, will yet inform the public of their existence. Settled as the Seminoles and exiles now were on the Cherokee lands, all parties concerned were necessarily dissatisfied. The Creeks were disappointed, and greatly dissatisfied, at not having the exiles in their power, and charged our government with bad faith in not delivering that extraordinary people into their hands. The Cherokees had assured the Seminoles and exiles that our government would deal honorably with them, and would faithfully carry out the Treaty of Payne's Landing, with the proviso contained in the Supplemental Treaty, and they were now greatly dissatisfied at the refusal of the executive to observe this solemn stipulation, while the Seminoles and exiles were indignant at the deception, fraud, and perfidy practiced upon them. Complaints against the government now became general amongst all these tribes. All had been deceived, all had been wronged, 
and all became loud in their denunciations of the government. This feeling became more intense as time passed away. It was in vain that our Indian agents and military officers at the West endeavored to quiet this state of general discontent. The newspapers of that day gave intimations of difficulties among the Indians at the West. They stated in general terms the danger of hostilities, but omitted all allusion to the cause of this disquietude. The executive appeared to be paralyzed with the difficulties now thrown in his way. He urged upon the Indian agents and military officers to use all possible efforts to suppress these feelings of hostility, which now appeared ready to burst forth upon the first occasion, coolly insisting that at some future day the Seminoles and exiles would consent to remove on to Creek territory. At length the danger of hostilities became so imminent that the executive deemed it necessary to enter upon further negotiation in order to effect the long-cherished purpose of subjecting the exiles to Creek jurisdiction and consequent slavery. To effect this object it was necessary to select suitable instruments. Four Indian agents, holding their offices by the executive favor, were appointed to hold a council with their discontented tribes, and, if possible, to negotiate a new treaty with them. It is somewhat singular that no statesman, no person favorably known to the public, or possessing public confidence, was selected for so important a service. Of course, any treaty formed under such circumstances and by such agents would conform to the executive will. The treaty bears the date on the 25th of January, and we insert the preamble and those articles which have particular relation to the subject matter of which we are speaking. They are as follows. Articles of a treaty made by William Armstrong, P. M. Butler, James Segan, and Thomas S. Judge, Commissioners in behalf of the United States, of the first part, the Creek Tribe of Indians, of the second part, and the Seminole Indians, of the third part. Whereas it was stipulated in the fourth article of the Creek Treaty of 1833, that the Seminoles should thenceforward be considered a constituent part of the Creek Nation, and that a permanent and comfortable home should be secured for them on the lands set apart in said treaty as the country of the Creeks. And whereas many of the Seminoles have settled and are now living in the Creek country, while others, constituting a large portion of the tribe, have refused to make their homes in any part thereof, assigning as a reason that they are unwilling to submit to Creek laws and government, and that they are apprehensive of being deprived by the Creek authorities of their property. And whereas repeated complaints have been made to the United States government, that those of the Seminoles who refuse to go into the Creek country, have, without authority or right, settled upon lands secured to other tribes, and that they have committed numerous and extensive depredations upon the property of those upon whose lands they have intruded. Now, therefore, in order to reconcile all difficulties respecting location and jurisdiction, to settle all disputed questions which have arisen or may hereafter arise in regard to rights of property, and especially to preserve the peace of the frontier, seriously endangered by the restless and warlike spirit of the intruding Seminoles, the parties to this treaty have agreed to the following stipulations. Article 1. The Creeks agree that the Seminoles shall be entitled to settle in a body, or separately, as they please, in any part of the Creek country, that they shall make their own town regulations, subject, however, to the general control of the Creek Council, in which they shall be represented, and, in short, that no distinction shall be made between the two tribes, in any respect, except in the management of their pecuniary affairs, in which neither shall interfere with the other. Article 2. The Seminoles agree that those of their tribe who have not done so before the ratification of this treaty shall immediately thereafter remove to and permanently settle in the Creek country. Article 3. It is mutually agreed by the Creeks and Seminoles that all contested cases between the two tribes concerning the right of property growing out of sales or transactions that may have occurred previous to the ratification of this treaty shall be subject to the decision of the President of the United States. The leading feature of this treaty 
is a studied effort to make no allusion to the exiles, or to recognize their existence in any way. General Jessup, in the Articles of Capitulation, had expressly stipulated for the protection of the persons and property of the allies of the Seminoles, but for half a century efforts had been made to exclude them from the page of our national history, and never was that policy more strikingly illustrated than in this treaty. As heretofore stated, the Seminoles were said to own some forty slaves, but the author has been unable to find any hint or intimation that any one of those slaves was claimed by the Creeks. Yet efforts were made to falsify the truth of history by representing the four or five hundred exiles now living with the Seminoles to be slaves to their friends and allies. The next extraordinary feature of the treaty is the recital of the Creek Treaty as binding upon the Seminoles, when they had been no party to it nor even had knowledge of its existence. But the third article is that on which both exiles and Seminoles appear to have relied. Thinking the President would do justice, feeling themselves subject to the power of the executive, and pressed on all sides to accede to terms of pacification, they signed the treaty as the best alternative that lay before them. In accordance with the past policy of the administration, this treaty was withheld from publication. It was, of course, submitted to the Senate in secret session for approval. It was then amended, and still kept from the public, for nearly two years after its negotiation. At the session of Congress, 1845-46, to a bill containing, among many other things, an appropriation to carry out this treaty, was reported by the Committee on Ways and Means of the House of Representatives, the treaty itself yet lay concealed in the office of the Secretary of the Senate, where it had been ratified in secret session, and not a member of the House of Representatives had seen it unless it was the chairman of the Committee of Ways and Means, or other confidential friends of the Executive, to whom it was given for personal examination. The bill was printed, and the author, seeing this provision, determined to know something of the treaty before voting money to carry it into effect. For this purpose, he called on one of the senators from Ohio, Honorable Thomas Corwin, to get a copy of the treaty. Mr. Corwin went with him to the office of the Secretary of the Senate, and after much inquiry, and passing from one clerk to another, a copy was obtained. When the bill came up for discussion, inquiry was made as to the treaty, its character and object. No member appeared to have any knowledge of it, save the chairman of the Committee of Ways and Means, Mr. McKay of North Carolina. The author of this work endeavored to give the House some idea of its origin, and in the course of his remarks referred to the manner in which the state of Georgia had been implicated in the persecution of the exiles. This reference to the state of Georgia awakened the ire of Mr. Black, a representative from that state, who advanced toward the author with uplifted cane, as if to inflict personal chastisement, and quite a scene followed, which at the time created some sensation in the country. End of chapter 22. Recording by Maria Casper. Chapter 23 of The Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE REUNION AND FINAL EXODUS The Creeks and Seminoles had been separated for nearly a century. They had most of that time lived under separate governments. Each tribe had been controlled by their own laws, and each had been independent of the other. They had often been at war with each other, and the most deadly feuds had been engendered and still subsisted among them. To unite them with the Creeks, and blot out the name of Seminole from the page of their future history, in order to involve the exiles in slavery, had long been a cherished object with the administration of our government. It was now fondly hoped that the object would be accomplished without further difficulty. But at no period had the Seminole Indians regarded the exiles with greater favor than they did when removing on to the territory assigned to the Creeks, Although many of them had intermarried with the Seminoles, and half-breeds were now common among the Indians, 
yet most of the descendants of the pioneers who had fled from South Carolina and Georgia maintained their identity of character, living by themselves and maintaining the purity of the African race. They yet cherished this love of their own kindred and color, and when they removed on to the creek lands, they settled in separate villages, and the Seminole Indians appeared generally to coincide with the exiles in the propriety of each maintaining their distinctive character. During the summer and autumn, both Indians and exiles became residents within Creek jurisdiction, and the executive seemed to regard the trust held under the assignment made at Indian Spring, twenty-four years previously, as now fulfilled. Regarding the Creeks as holding the equitable or beneficial interest in the bodies of the exiles, under the assignment from their owners to the United States, and they being now brought under Creek jurisdiction, subject to Creek laws, the executive felt that his obligations were discharged and the whole matter left with the Creeks. This opinion appears also to have been entertained by the Creek Indians, for no sooner had the exiles and Seminoles located themselves within Creek jurisdiction than the exiles were claimed as the legitimate slaves of the Creeks, to these demands, the exiles and Seminoles replied that the President, under the Treaty of 1845, was bound to hear and determine all questions arising between them. The demands were therefore certified to the proper department for decision. But this sitting in judgment upon the heaven-endowed right of man to his liberty seemed to involve more personal moral responsibility than was desirable for the executive to assume and the claims remained undecided. The Creeks became impatient at the delay. They were a slaveholding people, as well as their more civilized but more infidel brethren of the slave states. The exiles, living in their own villages in the enjoyment of perfect freedom, had already excited discontent among the slaves of the Creek and Choctaw tribes and those of Arkansas, the Creeks appeared to feel that it had been far better for them to have kept the exiles in Florida than to bring them to the western country to live in freedom. Yet their claims under the Treaty of 1845, thus far, appeared to have been disregarded by the President. They had been unable to obtain a decision on them, and they now threatened violence for the purpose of enslaving the exiles unless their demands were peacefully conceded. The exiles, yet confident that the government would fulfill its stipulations to protect them and their property, repaired in a body to Fort Gibson, and demanded protection of General Arbuckle, the officer in command. He had no doubt of the obligation of the United States to lend them protection, according to the express language of the Articles of Capitulation entered into with General Jessup in March 1837. He therefore directed the whole body of exiles to encamp and remain upon the lands reserved by the United States near the fort, and under their exclusive jurisdiction, assuring them that no creek would dare set foot upon that reservation with intentions of violence towards any person. Accordingly, the exiles who yet remained free now encamped around Fort Gibson, and were supported by rations dealt out from the public stores. As soon as he could ascertain all the facts, General Arbuckle made a report to the War Department relative to their situation, and the claims which they made to protection under the Articles of Capitulation, together with the rights which the Creeks set up to re-enslave them. This state of circumstances appears to have been unexpected by the Executive. Indeed, he appears from the commencement to have underrated the difficulties which beset the enslavement of a people who were determined upon the enjoyment of their freedom. He seems to have expected the Negroes, when once placed within Creek jurisdiction, would have yielded without further effort. But he was now placed in a position which constrained him either to repudiate the pledged faith of the nation, or to protect the exiles in their persons and property, according to the solemn covenants which General Jessup had entered into with them. Yet the President was disposed to make farther efforts to avoid the responsibility of deciding the question before him. General Jessup had entered into the Articles of Capitulation, and the President appeared to think he was competent to give construction to them. He therefore referred the subject to that officer, stating the circumstances and reminding him of the substance of his undertaking in regard to the Articles of Capitulation with the Exiles. 
General Jessup appears to have now felt a desire to do justice to that friendless and persecuted people. Without waiting to answer the President, he at once wrote General Arbuckle, saying, The case of the Seminole Negroes is now before the President. By my proclamation, and the convention made with them when they separated from the Indians and surrendered, they are free. The question is whether they shall be separated from the Seminoles and removed to another country, or be allowed to occupy, as they did in Florida, separate villages in the Seminole country, west of Arkansas. The latter is what I promised them. I hope, General, you will prevent any interference with them at Fort Gibson, until the President determines whether they shall remain in the Seminole country, or be allowed to remove to some other. General Arbuckle, faithful to the honor of his government, continued to protect the exiles. He fed them from the public stores, not doubting that the executive would redeem the pledge of the nation given by General Jessup, its authorized agent. But the President, Mr. Polk, himself a slaveholder, with his prejudices and sympathies in favor of the institution, did not understand the articles of capitulation according to the construction put upon them by General Jessup. He appears, therefore, to have called on the General for a more explicit report of the facts. In reply to this call, he reported, saying, At a meeting with the three Indian chiefs and the Negro chiefs, August and Carollo, I stipulated to recommend to the President to grant the Indians a small tract of country in the southeastern part of the peninsula, but it was distinctly understood that the Negroes were to be separated from them at once and sent west, whether the Indians were permitted to remain in Florida or not. With the Negroes it was stipulated that they should be sent west as part of the Seminole Nation, and be settled in a separate village, under the protection of the United States. In another letter, addressed to the Secretary of War, he says, A very small portion of the Seminole Negroes who went to the West were brought in and surrendered by their owners under the capitulation of Fort Dade. Over these Negroes the Indians have all the rights of masters. But all the other Negroes, making more than nine-tenths of the whole number, either separated from the Indians and surrendered to me, or were captured by the troops under my command, I, as commander of the army, and in the capacity of a representative of my country, solemnly pledged the national faith that they should not be separated, nor any of them sold, to white men or others, but be allowed to settle and remain in separate villages under the protection of the United States. But even with these explicit statements before him, the President appears to have been unable to form an opinion and he referred the matter to the Attorney General, Honorable John Y. Mason of Virginia, who had been bred a slaveholder, and fully sympathized with the slave power. He, having examined the whole subject, delivered a very elaborate opinion embracing seven documentary pages, but concluding with the opinion that although the exiles were entitled to their freedom, the executive could not interfere in any manner to protect them as stipulated by General Jessup, but must leave them to retire to their towns in the Indian Territory, where they had a right to remain. We should be unfaithful to our pledged purpose, were we to omit certain important facts connected with this opinion of the Attorney General. Nathan Clifford of Maine was appointed Attorney General of the United States in 1846, soon after the report of General Arbuckle concerning the situation of the exiles reached Washington. The subject was before the President more than two years. This delay we cannot account for, unless it were to save Mr. Clifford, being a northern man, from the responsibility of deciding the question, involving important interests of the slaveholding portion of our Union. In 1848 Mr. Clifford was appointed minister to Mexico, an Honorable Isaac Toucy of Connecticut was appointed Attorney General. But he, too, was from a free state, and it would throw upon him great responsibility were he constrained to act upon this subject. Were he to decide in favor of the exiles, it might ruin his popularity at the South, and, if against them, it would have an equally fatal effect at the North. Under these circumstances, recourse was had to an expedient— before Mr. Toosey entered upon the discharge of his official duties, 
Mr. Mason, himself a slaveholder, was appointed to discharge the duties ad interim. He entered the office, wrote out the opinion referred to, and then resigned the office and emoluments to Mr. Toosey, having decided no other question, nor discharged any other duty, than this exercise of official influence for the enslavement of the exiles. The President affirmed the principles decided by the Attorney General, and the exiles were informed that they had the right to remain in their villages, free from all interference or interruption from the Creeks. They had no other lands, no other country, no other homes. Many of their families were connected by marriage with the Seminoles. They and the Seminole Indians had, through several generations, been acquainted with each other. They had stood beside each other on many a battlefield. Seminoles and exiles had fallen beside each other, and were buried in the same grave. They had often sat in council together, and the exiles were unwilling to separate from their friends. Wildcat and Abraham and Lewis, and many leading men and warriors of the exiles and Seminoles, having deliberated upon the subject, united in the opinion that the exiles should return to their villages and reside upon the lands to which they were entitled. In accordance with this decision, they returned to their new homes, resumed their habits of agriculture, and for a time all was quiet and peaceful. But their example was soon felt among the slaves of Arkansas and of the surrounding Indian tribes. Nor is it to be supposed that the holders of slaves in any state in the Union would be willing to admit that so large a body of servants could by any effort separate from their masters for a century and a half, maintain their liberty, and after so much effort to re-enslave them, be permitted to enjoy their liberty in peace. Hundreds of them had been seized in Florida and enslaved. The laws of slave states presumed every black person to be a slave, and it was evident that if they could once be subjected to the will of some white man, the laws of Arkansas would enable him to hold them in bondage. An individual, a slave dealer, appeared among the Creeks, and offered to pay them one hundred dollars for each exile they would seize and deliver to him, he stipulating to take all risk of title. This temptation was too great for the integrity of the Creeks, who were smarting under their disappointment and the defeat of their long-cherished schemes of re-enslaving the exiles. Some two hundred Creek warriors collected together, armed themselves, and making a sudden descent upon the exiles, seized such as they could lay their hands upon. The men and most of the women and children fled, but those who had arms collected, and presenting themselves between their brethren and the Creeks who were pursuing them, prepared to defend themselves and their friends. The Creeks, unwilling to encounter the danger which threatened them, ceased from further pursuit, but turning back, dragged their frightened victims who had been already captured to the Creek villages, and delivered them over to the slave dealer, who paid them the stipulated price. The Seminole agent, learning of this outrage, at once repaired to the nearest judge in Arkansas, and obtained a writ of habeas corpus. The exiles were brought before him, in obedience to the command of the writ, and a hearing was had. The agent showed the action of General Jessup, the sanction of the capitulation of March 1837 by the executive, the opinion of the Attorney General, and action of the President, deciding the exiles to be free and in all respects entitled to their liberty. But the judge decided that the Creeks had obtained title by virtue of their contract with General Jessup, that neither General Jessup nor the President had any power to emancipate the exiles, even in time of war, that the Attorney General had misunderstood the law, that the title of the Creek Indians was legal and perfect, and they, having sold them to the claimant, his title must be good and perfect. No sooner was the decision announced than the manacled victims were hurried from their friends and the scenes of such transcendent crimes and guilt. They were placed on board a steamboat and carried to New Orleans. There they were sold, to different purchasers, taken to different estates, and mingling with the tide of human victims, who are septennially murdered upon the cotton and sugar plantations of that state, they now rest in their quiet graves, or perhaps have shared the more unhappy fate of living and suffering tortures incomparably worse than death. 
The year 1850 was distinguished by a succession of triumphs on the part of the slave power. While the President and his Cabinet, and members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, were seeking the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, while slaveholders and their northern allies appeared to be aroused in favor of oppression within the states of our Union, their savage coadjutors of the Indian Territory were equally active. There yet remained some hundreds of exiles in that far distant territory, unsubdued, and enjoying liberty. They had witnessed the duplicity, the treachery of our government, often repeated, toward themselves and their friends. They had, most of them, been born in freedom. They had grown to manhood, had become aged amidst persecutions, dangers, and death. They had experienced the constant and repeated violations of our national faith, its perfidy was no longer disguised. If they remained, death or slavery would constitute their only alternative. One, and only one, mode of avoiding such a fate remained. That was, to leave the territory, the jurisdiction of the United States, and flee beyond its power and influence. Mexico was free. No slave clanked his chains under its government. Could they reach the Rio Grande? could they place themselves safely on Mexican soil, they might hope yet to be free. A council was held. Some were connected with Seminoles of influence, those who were intimately connected with Indian families of influence, and most of the half-breeds, feeling they could safely remain in the Indian territory, preferred to stay with their friends and companions. Of the precise number who thus continued in the Indian country, we have no certain information, but some three hundred are supposed to have determined on going to Mexico, and perhaps from one to two hundred concluded to remain with their connections in the Indian country. Abraham had reached a mature age, had great experience, and retained influence with his people. Louis Pacheco, of whom we spoke in a former chapter, with his learning, his shrewdness and tact, was still with them, and so were many able and experienced warriors. Wildcat, the most active and energetic chief of the Seminole tribe, declared his unalterable purpose to accompany the exiles, to assist them in their journey, and defend them if assailed. Other Seminoles volunteered to go with them. Their arrangements were speedily made. Such property as they had was collected together and packed for transportation. They owned a few western ponies, their blankets, which constituted their beds, and some few cooking utensils and agricultural implements, were placed upon their ponies, or carried by the females and children, while the warriors, carrying only their weapons and ammunition, marched, unencumbered even by any unnecessary article of clothing, prepared for battle at every step of their journey. After the sun had gone down, September 10th, their spies and patrols, who had been sent out for that purpose, returned, and reported that all was quiet, that no slave-hunters were to be seen. As the darkness of night was closing around them, they commenced their journey westwardly. Amid the gloom of the evening, silent and sad, they took leave of their western homes, and fled from the jurisdiction of a people who had centuries previously kidnapped their ancestors in their native homes, brought them to this country, enslaved them, and during many generations had persecuted them. Many of their friends and relatives had been murdered, for their love of liberty, by our government. Others had been doomed to suffer and languish in slavery, a fate far more dreaded than death. At the period of this exodus, their number was probably less than at the close of the Revolution. When the slaveholding Creeks learned that the exiles had left, they collected together and sent a war-party in pursuit, for the purpose of capturing as many as they could, in order to sell them to the slave-dealers from Louisiana and Arkansas, who were then present among the Creeks, encouraging them to make another piratical descent upon the exiles for the capture of slaves. This war-party came up with the emigrants on the third day after leaving their homes. But Wildcat and Abraham, and their experienced warriors, were not to be surprised, they were prepared and ready for the conflict. With them it was death or victory. They boldly faced their foes. Their wives and children were looking on with emotions not to be described. 
with the coolness of desperation, they firmly resolved on dying or on driving back the slave-catching creeks from the field of conflict. Their nerves were steady, and their aim fatal. Their enemies soon learned the danger and folly of attempting to capture armed men who were fighting for freedom. They fled, leaving their dead upon the field, which is always regarded by savages as a dishonorable defeat. The exiles resumed their journey, still maintaining their warlike arrangement. Directing their course southwesterly, they crossed the Rio Grande, and continuing nearly in the same direction, they proceeded into Mexico, until they reached the vicinity of the ancient but now deserted town of Santa Rosa. In that beautiful climate they found a rich, productive soil. Here they halted, examined the country, and finally determined to locate their new homes in this most romantic portion of Mexico. Here they erected their cabins, planted their gardens, commenced plantations, and resumed their former habits of agricultural life. There they yet remain. Forcibly torn from their native land, oppressed, wronged, and degraded, they became voluntary exiles from South Carolina and Georgia, more recently exiled from Florida, and then from the territory of the United States. They are yet free. After the struggles and persecutions of a hundred and fifty years, they repose in comparative quiet under a government which repudiates slavery. To the pen of some future historian we must consign their subsequent history. Before taking leave of the reader, we would call his attention to a review of the fate which attended different portions of the exiles, and to a few further incidents, for some of which we have only newspaper authority, but from all the circumstances we have no doubt they actually transpired. Of the exiles and their descendants, twelve were delivered up at the Treaty of Colerain in 1796 and consigned to slavery. Two hundred and seventy were massacred at Blount's Fort in 1816. Thirty were taken prisoners. These all died of wounds or were enslaved. At the different battles in the First Seminole War in 1818, it is believed that at least four hundred were slain, including those who fell at Blount's Fort. In the Second Seminole War, probably seventy-five were slain in battle, and five hundred were enslaved, and at least seventy-five were seized by the Creek Indians in 1850 and enslaved. Probably a hundred and fifty connected with the Seminoles now reside in the western country, and will soon become amalgamated with the Indians, while three hundred have found their way to Mexico and are free making in all thirteen hundred and fifty souls, being some hundreds less than was reported by the officers of government in 1836. This discrepancy is accounted for by the fact that the exiles captured by individual enterprise and by the Georgia and Florida militia were never officially reported to the War Department, and we have no reliable data on which we can fix an estimate of the number thus piratically enslaved. There are also a few yet in Florida, not included in the above estimates. As to their present situation, we can give the reader but little further information. In the summer of 1852, Wildcat suddenly appeared among his friends, the Seminoles, who yet remained in the Indian country. His appearance excited surprise among the Creeks. They at that time maintained a guard composed of mounted men, these were at once put in motion for the purpose of arresting this extraordinary chieftain. But while they were engaged in looking for him, he and a company of Seminoles, attended by a number of exiles and black persons previously held in bondage by the Creeks, were rapidly wending their way toward their new settlement. This visit of Wildcat to the western country occasioned much excitement in that region, as well as astonishment at Washington, and constituted the occasion of protracted correspondence between the War Department and our military officers and Indian agents of that country. Wildcat was denounced as a pirate, robber, outlaw, and nearly all the opprobrious epithets known to our language were heaped upon him, for thus aiding his fellow men to regain those rights of life and liberty with which the God of Nature had originally endowed them. During the year 1852, 
while our commissioners, appointed to establish the boundary between the United States and Mexico, were engaged in the discharge of their official duties, a small party of armed men was in attendance for their protection. Some eight of these were said to have been engaged in patrolling the country, when they fell in with Wildcat and a portion of this band of exiles, who were at all times prepared for friends or foes. The whites were made prisoners, without bloodshed, and taken to their village. A council was called. Abraham was yet living, and the white men declared that he was regarded as a ruling prince by his people. They were evidently suspicious of the intentions of our men, but upon inquiry and consideration they became satisfied that no hostile intentions had brought our friends to that country. They were accordingly treated with becoming hospitality and dismissed. These brief statements appeared in some of the newspapers of that day, which constitutes our only authority for stating them. Complaints were subsequently made through the Texan newspapers that slaves escaped from that region of the country, found an asylum in Mexico, on the other side of the Rio Grande, and intimations were thrown out that a party of volunteers, without authority from the United States, were about to visit that settlement, which thus encouraged slaves to seek their freedom. The suggestion was so much in character with the slaveholders of Texas, that it excited attention among those who were aware of the settlement of exiles in the region indicated. It was believed that those men who were about to visit Wildcat and Abraham and Lewis and their companions, for the purpose of seizing and enslaving men, would find an entertainment for which they were not prepared. Some months subsequently, a brief reference was made in the newspapers of Texas to this expedition, giving their readers to understand that it had failed of accomplishing the object intended, and that it had returned with its numbers somewhat diminished by their conflict with the blacks. As was naturally expected, after the lapse of some six months, great complaint was heard through the public press of Indian depredations upon the frontier of Texas. Plantations were said to be destroyed, buildings burned, people murdered, and slaves carried away. This foray was said to have been made by Comanche Indians, led on by Wildcat, he appears yet ready to make war upon all who fight for slavery, and many of the scenes which were enacted in Florida will most likely be again presented on our southwestern frontier, where the same causes exist which formerly existed in Florida, and the same effects will be likely to follow. End of chapter 23 Recording by Maria Casper End of The Exiles of Florida by Joshua Giddings